Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. Uh, can I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Education Committee and ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep this all members in the spotlight for the next four this items. Is the Agenda item one, members, is apologies. Uh, are we aware of any apologies? No. Okay, that's great. Uh, Agenda item two, chairperson's business. Can I remind members that the Education Minister was due to brief the committee today but has had to postpone the briefing due to executive business. The minister is next available to brief the committee in the afternoon of Tuesday, the 23rd of March. Uh, the proposed time is Tuesday, the 23rd of March at 2 p.m. I, I understand that conflicts with assembly question time, uh, and I can assure members that the clerk and I sought all possible alternative dates and times prior to the Easter break, as I think it is extremely important that we hear from the Minister prior to the Easter break, given the ur urgent issues in relation to school restart and examinations, amongst a wide range of other issues. Um, are, are members available and, and content to schedule that additional committee meeting for Tuesday the 23rd of March at 2 p.m.? Yes, but Chair, can I bring a, a brief point to, to supplement this in terms of restart? Go ahead, Daniel. There, there is an issue emerging here, and, and I've had uh, communication from various schools uh, that uh, the effects of Brexit uh, are having uh, a great impact on schools, and uh, uh, there, there's particular difficulty in procuring equipment and other supplies, uh, as many companies are not supplying goods to Northern Ireland schools, um, and, and some have announced 68 week delays. So th this is a very serious situation for many schools because a lot of them have been caught off guard uh, and uh, in terms of procuring these schools for restart, uh, the supplies for restart is causing considerable issues. Now, I would have raised it with the minister today, but he's gone wondering, uh, as usual, when there's questions to be asked, uh, nowhere to be seen. So uh, I've submitted uh, urgent questions to the minister to ascertain what plans he has uh, uh, and what he's going to put in place to support schools and how they're going to procure uh, these important uh, resources. Uh, so th this is a big issue. The last thing we want is our children's education further disrupted. But clearly it's very difficult to get answers from the Minister, who's away wandering today. But th th this will cause disruption for restart, absolutely, Chair. Thanks, Daniel. Um, there will obviously be a wide range of other issues. For example, special school staff vaccination. A number of those will come forward in our, our correspondence section as well. So I'm not proposing that we rehearse all of the issues that all of us would like to raise with the Education Minister, or we might be here for quite some time, but is that Tuesday the 23rd of March at 2pm um, viable for people as an additional com uh, committee meeting in order to facilitate that engagement with the Minister? Doesn't doesn't relate to me, Chair, to be fair, um, actually. Um, okay, so uh, ju just a second. If, if people could just indicate with their hand, um, uh, I'll bring you in, Robbie, and then I think Pat Sheehan after that. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, that, that date and time doesn't actually suit me terribly well. I could do later in in that day if it was if it was okay, um, but that, that time doesn't suit me on a Tuesday. I have a commitment for about an hour and a half uh, and a business committee before that, so it's, it's a bad lead-in. So I could do it later on in that day if people wrote into that. Yeah, as I say, Robbie, the, the clerk and I can um, take feedback and try and make adjustments. However, I, I, I really can't understate the limited amount of uh, date and times that were made available to us prior to the Easter break um, to, to the point where I, I, I think it is this slot or nothing prior to the Easter break with the, the minister. And that is not of our making, I should hasten to add. But yeah. there are a, a, a number of wide ranging issues. So uh, we'll, we'll take that feedback in terms of uh, the time on that afternoon, Robbie, and we'll see what we can do and come back to you. Pat, Appreciate you that. Want to come in there as well. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I'm just wondering, is that a plenary day? It, it is, Pat. It, as I said, it's a direct clash with question time. Yeah, and, and it, that in itself could create problems. I mean, it's extremely important that we have the minister in front of the committee. Uh, and we have the ability to put questions to him. Uh, I, I think it's unacceptable that he can't come at another time uh, when there's not a plenary in session. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, Pat. I, I acknowledge that that is a direct clash and it, it, it would involve 
assembly members um, foregoing other duties in order to facilitate the minister. Um, we're, in terms of our committee sessions, we're obviously um, limited by the fact that next Wednesday, the 17th of March, is St. Patrick's Day, um, and then the Easter break uh, commences on Wednesday, the 31st, uh, or sorry, will be in, in, in course on Wednesday, the 31st of March. So um, we only have next we or sorry, Wednesday, the 24th of March available to us. We offered to change our schedule in that, on that uh, meeting day to accommodate the minister, um, and that wasn't possible. Um, I, you know, I, I'm happy to, to, to go back, but um, I, I think the necessity to engage with the minister may override the difficulty that that date and time causes for members. Would be would be my view, but I will I will take feedback. Any other members want to come in? No. Okay. I, I we will we will go back um, with the members' responses. But as I said, I, you you can trust me that mm -hmm. I did not settle for uh, a date and time that is a direct clash with assembly question time. Lately, um, we did explore everything that we could. But we will we'll take that back and see what we can do, and, and we'll correspond with uh, members accordingly to try and get that resolved. Members, content? Well, Chair, uh, not uh, well. I'm content with your suggestion, but you know the frustration with this is overwhelming. To be honest, you know the ministers returned schools, and yes, we all want children to be back in schools safely. But like, I have a hundred and one questions to ask this minister about what he has put in place to ensure that kids have returned safely. And the teacher who returned to the classroom safely. And to be very blunt and honest, it's no secret I have very little confidence in Peter Weir as a minister for education, but this is just every principal in my constituency and beyond, right across the north, are asking me questions, and I can't get answers because Peter Weir won't answer them. Like, this is really frustrating. Things have returned, and there's a hundred questions to be asked and no answers. And now he's wandering around trying, trying to dodge us and make it awkward for us to meet him. Like we should be pulling together and working together, but this minister doesn't want to work with this committee. It's very clear. Okay. Chair, Chair, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Chair, you, you, stated at, you, started, you stated at the start of the meeting that the, the minister was away on executive business. Today, yes. That to me doesn't suggest he's off wandering anywhere. And if I had 100 questions to the minister, the first person I would contact would be the minister, but I wouldn't be waiting until a committee day. And I, and I agree, and I share the frustration that the rest of the committee do, that we can't meet the minister coming up to his vital time and, and kid going back to school. But we need to moderate our accusations and, and, and our language a wee bit. You know, we need to work together, as, as Justin has, as, as, uh, or as Daniel has said, and we need to do it a wee bit more, I think, amenable way to everybody. Okay. Thanks for that, Thank Morris. Okay, members, Clark, are you content uh, that we would um, respond to the minister by the department to express, um, I think it's fair to say there, there is a, a, a significant degree of, of frustration um, at um, the um, date and time that has been offered to meet being a direct conflict with assembly plenary business. Um, and to ask if there are any other dates and times that do not um, directly conflict with assembly plenary business. Um, are members content with that response? Yeah, um, I believe the department was listening in to see whether the, um, that slot would work, um, and I've, I've just asked them about the 3.30, in case that's an option, and um, we would have broadcast availability to, to run it on a on, at 3.30 on the 23rd, and the question times in, um, in that afternoon are to Department of Justice and the Assembly Commission, just for your information, members. So if there's any okay. change on the afternoon timing, I will let everyone know. Okay. Um, as, as I say, members, I'm not... Uh, you've seen enough of me to know that I will not accept... Uh, an inconvenient, uh, a direct conflict with assembly plenary business lately. Um, but having wrestled with every other possible potential date and time,
this appears to be to be the date and time available to meet with the minister as soon as possible, as far in advance of the Easter break as possible. And um, that, to, to me, the, the need to engage with the minister on a, a wide range of extremely urgent, important issues um, may override the, um, the limitation that we'll put on MLAs in terms of them being able to engage with assembly plenary business that day. But we will, we will see if there are any other uh, non-assembly business dates and times available. And if there are not, I'll come back to members um, in regards to that date and time. Someone else wants to come in, I'm going to need to move us on. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, just very quickly, sure. Why can we yep. not meet some evening? Why can we not meet on Saturday or Sunday? The, 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 the potentially the prompt answer to that, uh, Justin, is the need to, I would imagine, my personal opinion, I imagine it would be shared by other MLAs, is the need to have assembly broadcasting in place. And I'm, I'm not uh, clear that that would be possible at those dates and times. I could certainly ask in relation to that as well. Um, it, it, you know, it, it does seem to be stretching things quite far that we can't find a, a suitable date and time within um, day working hours. But we we all frequently work in the evening, so if that if that assembly broadcasting can facilitate that, then I I will consider whatever date and times are available. Um, is our, our members content to entrust me with exploring that? Um, and to return to you with alternative dates and times or to seek your agreement on that current date and time. Yeah, yep. Okay. Okay, members. Uh, Clark, is that okay? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks to the clerk for the work that um, she has been doing to try and correspond with the department and to get dates and times in place. Um, we, there are a number of factors at play. As Mara said, executive business, um, assembly broadcasting availability, um, as well as uh, assembly plenary. So it, it, it has required a fair bit of work, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. It sounds like it's going to require a bit more work as well, but hopefully we will get engaging with the Education Minister as soon as possible. Okay, members, agenda item 2.2. Can I remind members of the proposed committee stakeholder event to be held on Zoom on the 24th of March at 6 p.m.? to engage with a, a wider group of children and young people uh, about the impact of uh, COVID-19, obviously, in, in addition to the engagement that we're facilitating today. Are members content to proceed as outlined by email from the clerk in relation to that event? Agreed? Yeah, agreed, Chair. Yeah, I think the clerk, it would be helpful for the clerk to get uh, some firm responses from members in relation to that event. It's obviously uh, vital for stakeholder engagement for MLAs to be um, engaged and present. So if we could get a, a firm response from members on that to directly to the clerk, that would be super. Okay, agenda item 2.3 is our informal meeting with the Northern Ireland Teaching Council on the General Teaching Council, Northern Ireland. Can I inform the committee? members that we held an informal meeting with the Northern Ireland Teaching Council regards concerns about the General Teaching Council. A note on the meeting will be distributed to members before the committee meeting on Wednesday the 24th of March when we will hear from the General Teaching Council and the Department of Education. Agenda item 2.4, exam assessments. Can I inform members that numerous concerns have been raised about the recent announcement about centre determined assessments for GCSEs, A level, and other qualifications. And can I, I seek members' agreement to arrange an informal meeting on Tuesday, the 16th of March at 9 30 or, or earlier? Um, Robbie, I'm conscious that you have a meeting at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, a standing meeting. I mean, we can make that 9 15 or 9 o'clock if that, if that is helpful. Um, by a star leaf to hear from the the Northern Ireland Teaching Council and, and perhaps ASCO as well, I would propose on this matter. Uh, are members available for that meeting? Robbie, do you want to come in? Yes, please, Chair, if you, if you would mind. I would really appreciate it if we could make that uh, a 9 o'clock or 9.15 start, guys. And the reason being, genuinely became really concerned over the weekend uh, with regard to what's planning and, and wait for our teachers and our pupils, um, particularly with regard to what looks like exams to me, with being called assessments in a highly controlled environment. So, 
which is really an option I'll leave, but if you could if you guys could work it from nine or nine fifteen it would allow me then to, to then go to my, my standing ten o'clock meeting on Tuesdays. I appreciate that. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Robbie. Are members content that we make that meeting uh nine o'clock on Tuesday the sixteenth of March? Content. Sure. Yeah, okay. Happy enough for that, Clark? Yeah, and would you like Askill as well, Chair? Yeah, I think that would be uh, mm -hmm. beneficial. Okay. Okay, members. Okay, members, there have been a, a, a number of other announcements uh, made by the Minister as well. Uh, the announcement of the Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework, uh, announcement on anti-bullying legislation. Um, uh, you know, in a even even the school restart um, issues, which have have had a number of, of media interventions, um, I, I, I'm so, somewhat concerned that these announcements are being made by way of assembly statement to allow members to respond and interact with them, um, and I, and that's something that I would I would wish to raise with the minister when we are able to meet with them. Uh, any members want to comment on that in closing before we move on to our other agenda items? Nope. Yes, Chair, could I come in there, please? Pat, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, I mean, it's it's disappointing when we hear announcements like this in the media and uh, the proper procedures in the Assembly aren't being used, and that's not how it should be. I mean, in, in, in contrast, uh, the Health Minister seems willing to come to the Assembly uh, quite often, probably more often than any other minister, and while I have issues with the health minister around the whole issue of the pandemic, certainly in terms of his availability, both to the assembly itself and to committee, is in stark contrast to this uh, education minister. So, I mean, I, I definitely think it's something that should be raised. And, uh, I mean, just one other issue. I mean, at a, at a time when school budgets are under severe pressure and by the looks of it are going to be under pressure for the foreseeable future, it's absolutely galling to listen to this media attention, the, 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 the nonsense about this tunnel going to be built when everybody knows it's just absolute pie in the sky, you know. But I'm just I'm just expressing my frustration there. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Uh, I, I share it. Uh, you know, you, you would think announcements on uh, launches of the Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework and progress on anti-bullying legislation would be issues that the minister would like to update the assembly on. So it, it is it is frustrating. Uh, any other members before I move on? No. Okay, then members, agenda item three is draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 3rd of March at page six of your packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Great, sir. Thank you. Okay, members, there are no matters arising. And that brings us to agenda item five, uh, our children and young people's voices briefing on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, particularly on uh, physical and mental health of children and young people. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 13? Briefing papers from the Secondary Students' Union of Northern Ireland on mental health matters, secondary school mental health reform in Northern Ireland at page 16. A briefing paper from the Crisis Cafe uh, in tabled papers. And thanks to the Children's Commissioner for uh, her recommendation on additional witnesses from her youth panel to attend our uh, engagement today. Can I, I have a, a long list of, of welcomes here, if you uh, bear with me. Uh, can I welcome, very, very warm welcome to Cormac Savage, the president of the Secondary Students Union for Northern Ireland, Morgan Shuttleworth, mental health officer for the Secondary Students Union Northern Ireland, Sophia Armstrong, community relations officer, Secondary Students Union for Northern Ireland, Inez Murray, representative of the Crisis Cafe, uh, Orrin McAllister, representative of the Crisis Cafe, Matthew Taylor, director and co-founder of Pure Mental, Theo Burton, policy officer for Pure Mental, Jay Bunting, director and co-founder 
of Pure Mental, Lauren McAreevy, representative from the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, Jack Dalzell, representative of the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, Bruna Close from the Children's Commissioner Youth Panel, and Tassie Court, representative of the Children's Commissioner Youth Panel. Can I give you all a really warm welcome today? Um, can I advise the witnesses uh, that we'll give each group uh, up to five minutes to make opening remarks, followed by questions from uh, members, which can be answered across the panel of witnesses. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing from you all today. We're acutely aware of the impact of the pandemic on children and young people, and I, I use every opportunity I can to thank the, the children and young people of Northern Ireland for the sacrifice that you've made to keep other people in our community safe and well throughout this pandemic and for the, the leadership that you have shown and that you are showing on so many issues um, for, on behalf of children and young people in Northern Ireland. And we, we look forward to hearing from you today and look forward to doing all that we can to support you in, in the leadership and the efforts that you're, you're making. Uh, on behalf of children and young people in our community. So, can I, will I start with Cormac Savage? Cormac? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Cormac. Uh, so, I, I'm the president of the Secondary Students' Union of Northern Ireland, and I'm joined here with Morgan and Sophia, our mental health and community relations officers. The, for any of you uh, on the committee maybe haven't heard of the Secondary Students' Union, we were founded in August. We set up in August last year just the day before thousands of A-level students were handed A-level grades that weren't true reflections of what they deserved. And so our first campaign we ever ran was called Trust Our Teachers. And I think that really set us up as a union for what we've been doing since. We've been developing student voice and really going and representing students on a lot of the issues that have come to light during the pandemic. So at the minute, we're an organization with 25,000 members across Northern Ireland. Uh, representing schools of every sector and every county in Northern Ireland. And we have been working on loads of projects to represent young people this year. The main one, which is in the papers there, the mental health report, which Morgan led along with our Mental Health Matters Working Group. And I'll pass over to him in a second to give you uh, some background on that. But uh, one issue that we really want to drive home today that is a massive issue for children and young people going forward uh, only really came to light in the past couple of days. And I was mentioned a minute ago there, and that's the issue of exams this year. We had campaigned for exams to be canceled since November. We knew that there was no equitable way exams could go ahead this year and that children and young people would be put at a significant disadvantage if they were made to do them. Um, we were very pleased when the minister made a statement to the assembly on what the alternative award and arrangements would be. But it feels like what has been announced now is in the spirit of what the minister announced on the floor of the assembly and what's been announced is instead exams by the back door and as young people are learning more about it and students are learning more about it there is an anxiety there is a fear and it is having an impact uh, basically when when you boil it down there is a possibility that a GCSE student who has whose teacher hasn't done any formal assessment all year, which they would be within their rights to do because of school closures and that the minister said teachers shouldn't be over assessing because exams would be going ahead. A GCSE student study in 10 subjects could theoretically in the four week period between after Easter and the end of May be doing 40 different tests, 10 per subject, four assessments it's needed for CCA, 10 per subject. The guidance is really worrying because that will severely damage the mental health of pupils. 84% told us in the mental health survey that an exam uncertainty had had a negative impact on their mental health. And I can only imagine what that number would be now that students are faced with the prospect of doing something that many are actually describing as being worse than having to do exam this year, even after prolonged school closures. So that's something I would really like to bring to the attention of members today, that just how, how children and young people have been almost um, blindsided by this announcement from SEA on Friday, an announcement our teachers are struggling to explain to us, struggling to break to us because it is a difficult piece of news to break. So there's a lot of issues with that that I hope we can get through today and members' questions, but I'll, 
aside from that, I do want to focus as well on the great work that the SSUNI have been doing across Northern Ireland. So part of that is the mental health report and Morgan, our mental health officer, I'll pass over to him now, was sort of the mastermind behind that along with our working group. Thanks, Cormac. Morgan, you might need to unmute your mic. Sorry about that. Uh, there you go. Thanks Thank for, you. Thanks, thanks Morgan. For Cormac, and thanks for having us, Sure. Um, I can only reiterate what Cormac was stating. Obviously, the mental health situation in Northern Ireland was already shocking compared to the counterparts in the UK and the Republic of Ireland. And the statistics have just gone through the roof. Um, during the pandemic, there have been no, we don't even know how bad it is because of the lack of research and reports done in the past year surrounding mental health. Uh, that's why this survey on our report is so important to help it, the students in need through the pandemic and through their mental health challenges in general. The survey was open for two weeks and in that period of time, we got two, over 2,100 students to anon anonymously respond to it, and a thousand of those were within 24 hours. Uh, some of the survey findings include 65% of students saying that their change in workload had altered their quality of learning. 71% said that self-isolating had uh, made their mental health suffer. And on a scale of one to 10 rate of <clears throat> their students rating their counseling services, 173 students rated their counselling skills counselling service as a one compared to 30, only 33 rating it a 10. I think that sort of speaks for itself um, in the you know progress that needs to be made um, to the counselling. At the end of the report, we had the policy recommendations which we're here presenting, um, which include communication, more communication and involvement with young people from the executive and from the education department in issues that are facing us, i.e. exams, mental health. Another one was EA guidance on how counselling services should be provided in schools. Uh, at the minute, there is no guidance and there's no um, infrastructure on how to run counselling services in schools. So it's left up to each individual school, which is impacting every student as some schools may not have the same budget, the same ideas surrounding counselling as it is up to the individual skills. The last one that I'd like to state is that counselling uh, funded by AA should be in increased to one day a week instead of half a day a week. We're aware that people have contacted us just through the Students' Union, through our e emails and social medias, that um, the school, their schools are paying for extra counsellors themselves because half a day just isn't enough to facilitate the huge waiting list of students that need um, the help that they're not getting. Thanks, Morgan. Cormac, have you anyone else to bring in? Yes, um, uh, I'll... As I say, we've been, this all does sound very doom and gloom, but a lot of the work we have been doing has been very positive outside of the goings on for young people in the pandemic. Um, you know, uh, we have great projects that have been running. Um, our education officer couldn't be here today, but um, James Kane, uh, along with a student council's working group of around 25 young people, is in the process of designing a, frame, a, mo a framework model student council for schools as well, which will try and revolutionize the way we look at student voice in the context of an individual school. Um, on top of that as well, Sophia Armstrong, our community relations officer, is running a fantastic new project on, called Student Centered Shared Ed, which she'll tell you more about now. And that's our next working group, which will be hopefully able to send a copy of the findings to the committee with that as well, eventually. Thanks, Colin. Sophia, do you want to? Yeah, um, so I had said to Cormac about setting up a working group um, about surrounding shared education, the fact that shared education had been largely set aside by the pandemic this year. You know, a lot of young people had missed out on the opportunity to experience what it's like see, meeting people in different communities that they wouldn't in school. Um, so 
we can only learn about like World War One and World War Two once or twice. Like every time going to shared education projects and learning about the same stuff and the same sort of environment and talking about the same issues, it sort of gets very boring after a certain amount of time. And um, having young people do their own education projects, I think it's really worthwhile seeing what actually works from a young person's perspective. Particularly me, I grew up in an integrated school that was involved in shared education. I'm very passionate about it. And I've missed out on that opportunity during lockdown as well. And I miss the relationships that I was building. And I can only echo what other students are feeling. So this working group is about design and shared education that is designed by young people for young people. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's sort of a flavour of some of what we've been doing as an organisation this year. Um, and, you know, just in general, being there for students to reach out to us, campaigning on issues like this exam one that I've raised before you today, which is a massive issue. And I hope we can discuss more about during questions later. So, Charles, thank you very much for the opportunity of uh, having us here. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, Cormac, Morgan and Sophia. Uh, you're doing incredible work, uh, extremely positive work. Uh, so we look forward to engaging with you today. Uh, can I bring in our Crisis Cafe representatives? Good morning. Morning. Um, hello, my name is Inez Murray and today I'm going to represent the Crisis Cafe. Um, I would firstly like to thank Robbie Butler for inviting us and um, I would like to thank the Education Committee for giving us the chance to give this oral briefing on School Restart and the impact of COVID-19 on young people. Um, Crisis Cafe is a mental health organisation that provides clinical help in a non-clinical setting. It aims to break the stigma surrounding mental health and lead the conversation about mental health and well-being in young people. We have known for years now that mental illness and pure, pure mental health is an epidemic in Northern Ireland. 12.6% of children and young people in Northern Ireland experience common mood disorders like anxiety and depression, and this is 25% higher than the rest of the UK. Yet with COVID-19 pandemic, this has only gotten worse. In our recent survey, we asked young people, do you feel that your mental well-being has suffered as a result of online learning? 85.3% of young people said yes. 85.3. That's a very shocking number, isn't it? Except it's not just a number. Every single one of those respondents is a young person with their whole life ahead of them struggling. Every single one of them has a family and friends and people who care about them. Every single one has hopes and dreams and ambitions of a better future, which is hard to see past the glare of a screen and the haze of uncertainty surrounding their exams. 85.3% might be a shocking number to you, but unfortunately it's not shocking to mental health organisations like Crisis Cafe and I who see it every day in their work, and to young people like myself and Oren who's also here representing us today and our friends. It's not shocking because it's our reality. It's our life and it's our struggle. As I mentioned, every single young person in our survey and across Northern Ireland who have and are struggling with their mental health as a result of the pandemic and online learning are unique and complex individuals. And as a result of that, we can't represent exactly every single of you today. Um, but I am going to tell you one story today, the one that I know my best and that, know the best, and that's my own. My name is Inez Murray. I'm 18 years old and I'm studying A-levels at Sacred Heart Grammar School in Newry. Um, I'll start in August when we returned. I was so excited to go back to school. I was going into my final year at school and I couldn't wait to see my friends in this last year before we went our separate ways. I was excited to sit in classrooms again, to talk to teachers, to queue up in the canteen and to whisper underneath your breath in the study hall so that the librarian didn't catch you catching up with your friends. I was so intrigued by the new content. I remember flicking through the specifications and I was just so excited to learn it all from the medulla to microeconomics. I couldn't wait because that's how you're supposed to feel going back to school. You're supposed to feel excited. And I was, but I was also terrified. My 89-year-old grandmother lives beside us and is in our support bubble. She eats her meals with us and I see her every day. So going into school wasn't necessarily me being worried about myself getting coronavirus, but I was worried I would bring it home to her. I wasn't just worried. I was terrified. How could I live with myself knowing that I had brought a deadly virus into our home? I don't know. The mental burden of that is immense. And it's not just me, it's thousands of other young people across Northern Ireland worried about the health of their families and their own health. But despite this, as a young person in school at the time, I was expected to just continue as normal. We all were. And I appreciate that sometimes adults believe that normalising this pandemic will make us feel better, but it's not normal. This isn't how it's supposed to be. 
you know what it's supposed to be like as teenagers. It's supposed to be the best year of your life. This year was supposed to be formals, 18th birthdays, and the cliques in your year group dissolving into a melting pot of new friendships and old. Needless to say, this hasn't happened. In fact, it's been the opposite. We use terms such as isolation and social distance to describe the physical acts that prevent the spread of COVID-19. But they also describe how it feels to be a young person in this pandemic. Isolated and with a social distance between you and your friends because you can't talk to new people. You can't reach out to old friends and you can't try to make new ones. You have to pick a few close friends and keep to yourself. You become insular and withdrawn. I find it hard to describe how detrimental that can be to a young person's mental health. To become insular at a time when you need new friends and a laugh the most. And to see it happen to all your friends too. It's just heartbreaking. And when there's absolutely no social life, young people find it hard to keep themselves sane. They'll obsess over their diet and exercise and I've seen far too many young people fall into that regime over the past few months where they'll pour themselves into schoolwork. Now that it's online learning, young people will stare at screens for hours on end just to catch up. Sitting here today, I know I'm behind and after I go on this call, I'm going to have to do a few more hours work just staring at a screen. We're studying so hard and it never ends. We don't know what we're working for. It's not healthy. The academic pressure bot that this pandemic has created, combined with the months of uncertainty from the Department of Education, has been so toxic for our mental health. Orrin will discuss this more, but young people feel let down in terms of exams. The Department of Education has had months on months to give clarity, and yet we're still in the dark. Young people already struggling with their mental health feel left behind by politicians. In our survey, 96.6% of young people would like more certainty on grading arrangements and exams. Only a measly 11.3% have faith in politicians to bring about these changes. We asked our respondents, the young people we work with, if they could say anything to the politicians here today, what would they say? There was many responses, but two words popped up over and over again. Two little words. Do better. We are here today at Stormont because you, politicians, and your predecessors agreed to put your differences aside so that the next generation of young people in Northern Ireland could have a chance at a brighter future. COVID-19 has taken a lot away from young people. But if we are given certainty and support from politicians like you, we could still have a chance at that brighter future. Please, give us that chance. Thank you very much, and I'll now pass on to Oren. Uh, hello everyone, i um, delighted to be speaking here today on behalf of the Crisis Cafe. My name is Oren, I'm the chairperson of the Youth Advisory Board of the Crisis Cafe. Um, I'm 17 from Newry. I'm a year 14 student currently studying at levels in St Paul's High School in Bassbrook. So after reflection, we must learn from the past and pave the way forward. We need solutions, but most importantly, we need stability. Having endured the pandemic and the educational hardships that come with it, we must now act to ensure young people never face these hardships again. Firstly, on the topic of mental health services and access to services within schools. The current access to mental health services in the majority of schools at the moment simply doesn't cut it. Having a mental health service in schools two or three days a week isn't good enough, with young people too often told the good news is you have an appointment, the bad news is the counselor isn't in today, you'll have to wait to Thursday or Friday. Young people need an easily accessible mental health service in schools, not two or three days a week, but a mental health service in schools five days a week. In a survey conducted by the Crisis Cafe, we asked young people, do they believe mental health services in schools were accessible enough? And the majority, 47% of our young people, indicated that mental health services in schools were not accessible enough, with 91% of respondents stating the need for an accessible mental health service five days a week. With an already existing mental health epidemic among young people accelerated by the pandemic, young people are at breaking point. We need a total reassessment of mental health support in schools. We need an identified member of staff whose primary focus is the mental well-being of young people in schools full time and a mental health service that is easily accessible at the point of request. We desperately need solutions, which brings me on to my second issue of exams and the issue of grading. At the current moment, the guidance from the Department of Education on how students will be graded this year was at the current moment, schools, young people and teachers, we've been left in limbo. We have been given very vague and unclear guidance from the Department of Education on how we'll be graded this year. What we got from the Education Minister was an announcement on the cancellation of summer exams, which at the time came to be a relief for many students. However, it is now clear this is not going to be the case. 
The guidance from the education minister was left too loosely, allowing schools to grade students any way they wish. This will lead to mass inequality when it comes to grading this summer, with some schools opting to simply give teacher judgment and others carrying on business as usual, setting exams anyway as a form of tracking, battling to make their grades more legitimate. In our survey, 96% of young people responded stating the need for more clarity in the grading situation, and that is exactly what we the students need. Clarity. We need one solution for all students in all schools, one which is a level playing field and most importantly values the mental well-being of students. Students have been learning from home since the Christmas break and this has brought increased stress and anxiety amongst the majority of young people and is evident for the large number of young people reaching out to the crisis cafe distressed and struggling with home learning and becoming increasingly worried about the grading situation. In our survey we asked young people how they were feeling about the issuing of results this August and a majority 61% indicated that they were feeling anxious. As an A-level student hoping to head to university in September, I too share the struggles and stress of online learning, as well as the immense worry on the ways in which grading will be conducted this summer. Our career ambitions, our prospects are on the line as well as our future. Just to summarise, we need increased mental health support for schools, fully accessible and available every school day, and this should have a direct link with mental health resources within the community. We need clarity in the exams and grading situation. We need assurances that when it does come to grading this summer, it will be a level playing field for each school and each student. That grading will be conducted in a way which takes into account the difficult circumstances students face throughout this academic year and a system which puts the mental health and well-being of students first. Students in Northern Ireland are set to return this month on March 22nd and upon return, things need to change. Since the Christmas break, young people have been reporting to the Crisis Cafe of increased stress and anxiety, increased isolation and loneliness, increased worry about reintegration, the impact of remote learning, feeling unmotivated, increase in feeling of hopelessness, increase in young people being prescribed medication. In order to support young people with the presenting concerns and support them with their return to school, we need a reassessment of mental health support in schools and assurances of no more school closures and no return to online learning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your contributions today, uh, folks, and, and for the work that, that you're doing. Um, this is going to be hard but important listening for us today. Um, we, we really value your, your testimonies. Can I bring in our Children's Commissioner Youth Panel representatives, please? Hi. Hi, Bruna. And I just really want to thank you for involving me and Casey in this. Bruna, we can't hear you. Um, can you go into your uh, settings uh, and, and just use the slider to turn your volume up, please? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. That's better. Okay, all of you can check that out. Thanks very much. Thanks, Clark. Thanks, Thanks Bruna. Uh, I just really want to thank uh, all of the committee for allowing me and Tazy to be involved in such a wonderful opportunity. I've been involved with Nikki for... Uh, the past two years now and during that time I have focused my priorities into getting involved in different subgroups that revolve around mental health. I think that education and receiving services like CAMS have been a big effect on young people's mental health during the pandemic. Children have a right to education and a right to health including mental health and currently they are not receiving that fully. Education and online school during the pandemic has affected a lot of people's mental health due to the immense pressure that we've been put under to complete assessments and learn all of our work online in order to receive our predicted grades. I know a lot of people feel anxiety about going back to school and I think there should have been more support given to us to work around this. A lot of people have been set too much work by their school and they're feeling stressed and they're feeling like they can't complete it all, but they're worried that if they don't complete it on time, that will affect their grade. I think that schools should provide more support to young people, especially young people who suffer from mental health problems and are particularly vulnerable during this pandemic. Places like the Education Authority Youth Service are more obligated than any other organisation to provide support for young people, yet 
there is a small amount of this being provided. I know that some youth workers have been providing online support systems or more targeted in real life small groups of young people. Um, and so I think that this should be provided for every school in Northern Ireland because there will be people in every school that have suffered mental health problems, especially since there's an increased risk of suicide during the pandemic. I also think that receiving services like CAMS has been incredibly difficult over the past year that we have been in the pandemic. Uh, on average, it takes 16 weeks for a young person in Northern Ireland to even be considered uh, eligible for a service like CAMS. And even then, that doesn't guarantee an appointment for another week, uh, another few weeks. Uh, I also think it's really difficult having services like CAMS and only being able to access them over the phone, especially since most young people will have to take this call during uh, normal school hours. So it may affect their online learning or they may not feel like they're being provided the correct privacy and confidentiality as they have to do it in their house where other members of their family can hear. It is also extremely emotionally draining to have to do it over the phone and you feel like you can't be as honest as you would be in real life. So I feel like education and services like CAM should be prioritised as we come out of lockdown and to make sure that children and young people are receiving these the way they have a right to. Uh, if I could just pass over to Tazy now. Hi, so I'm Tazy. I'm part of the NICI Youth Panel. And what we do is we protect the rights of children and, and young people in Northern Ireland and we make sure that they get their voices heard and that their rights are seen to. So we have a right 12, which means that we have the right to give our opinions about things that affect us. And over the course of the pandemic, We've seen that children are not always involved in the key decisions about exams, how the school will work, and we're always left behind. The Education Committee has taken time and time again to long descend the periods of time where we don't know what's happening. We are left uh, thinking that every test we do will be used at our end of grade. There's no room for improvement or seeing where you've gone wrong. Uh, a large part of testing in schools normally is that so you do your test and then you realise what you need to do and you have that period of time where you can work on it and not feel stressed because it's just a test. Now every test is an exam and we don't have the freedom to develop as we did. Um, every time we hand in a piece of work or submit a piece of work remotely, we have that fear that it's going to do, it's going to be used for our grade and that's a really big uh, stress for most children. Um, in 2018, Nikki released the Still Waiting campaign in which they listed eight topics that the government should do better on. We're still waiting for these changes, such changes such as uh, CAMS being more universal and easier to, uh, to obtain services, which is a right again. Uh, our right to education and right to play has been affected through the pandemic as we are isolated from peers. When we're with peers, we're seeing as teenagers being uh, dangerous or putting society at risk. Although we are sticking to the two metres for social distancing, we're still seen as a threat. Uh, children and young people in Northern Ireland have faced so much isolation during this period. These are our vital years of socialising. These are when we discover how to make social skills, how we reach out, how we test ourselves and see where we can go. But that has been a large disadvantage this year as we don't have the same services or the same opportunities as we once did. And there hasn't been enough done to ensure that kids are still having extracurriculars or time after school to socialise with their peers. You're in your class and then you're out. There's no break time, lunch time or class during or time during class to talk. And I feel like that's had a really big effect on the mental health of young people. Reaching out to each other, you would think through social media, it is a lot harder and we're not given enough credit for what we do. Reaching out online has been really difficult. You finish your work and you don't want to look at a screen again. You've already spent six hours looking at a screen. And the only way that we can communicate to our peers and to our friends and family is through a screen. 
And I just think that more needs to be done to ensure that when we do go back to school, we have the opportunity to have extracurricular clubs if they are socially distant, because we have a right to play and we have a right to talk to our peers and we have a right to be kids again. And I just think a lot of people have had to grow up really fast during the pandemic and we haven't had enough time to just let those to relax during school time because we're always working for that grade. It's not like the end of the year where you're constantly doing a little, little bit, bit, bit of work at a time. To get your final grade, everything we do now is judged. There is no room for error, or at least that's how the teachers make us feel. And it's been really difficult. And a lot of my friends, and myself including, have found every piece of work a lot more stressful. Every essay I do, I read over a hundred times before I submit it. And even when I do, I fear that it won't be good enough. And that's the thing that will be going towards my grade. Yes, we just got this back from the education committee saying that we're doing on the education board that we're going to be doing assessor center assess grades through these mini exams, which are still exams and they're still same pressure although we have more so instead of doing one big exam we have to be fearful of every single little exam we do it's a lot more pressure and a lot more self-inflicted pressure because we want to do the best because this is our future but we can't because we don't have the right teaching i know teachers as nikki we have discussed that we we know our teachers are struggling but we need more support and we need a larger amount of one-on-one -on -one with our teachers. You can't stay back after class and discuss something that you're worried about with your teacher. You can't have the same interactions and same class questions and discussions. And it's taken a lot out of our education and the time that we learn how to speak up for ourselves and share our opinions and views. Uh, so yeah, thank you for inviting us, Mr. Chair. But... Thank you, Bruna and Tacey. Um, you're, you're giving children and young people a, a big voice today. We're, we're really grateful for it. Thank you. Can I, I keep us moving then and invite our Northern Ireland Youth Forum representatives to come in? Yeah, morning, Chair. Morning, Lauren. Um, hello, committee, um, and thank you for the invite. It's totally inspiring to be here this morning. Um, I'm lucky enough to be considered still a young person at 23, um, but I am here on behalf of the Our Voices Steering Group to present, um, as Brona mentioned there previously, um, some of these events are not um, great timing for young people. So myself and Jack are here on behalf of the group. So Our Voices, um, Our Voices um, was created in response to meet the arising needs of, for young people in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. Like um, the other presenters have shared, it was important for us to engage directly with young people and hear from them around their key issues during the course of the pandemic. So far, we've conducted three pieces of youth-led regional research to date, with nearly 4,000 individual responses collected. For us, it was about identifying top issues for young people, capturing their views, opinions and thoughts, and creating platforms for young people to have a voice with decision makers and adults in power to engage with them and hold them to account. So what did we find out? The top five issues for young people. Um, at the top of this, we had two joint top issues, mental health and well-being and education, learning at home and exams, with 67% of our survey respondents highlighting them as a key issue for them at the time of surveying, which was November 2020. So, of course, this is slightly dated, but it still is relevant today. Um, in third, we had isolation and loneliness with 61%. Fourth, boredom with 56%, and at fifth, physical percent, physical health with 30%. In relation to mental health and isolation, 74% of respondents highlighted that they felt their mental health has gotten worse or much worse during the course of the pandemic, with only 29% of respondents feeling hopeful about their future. 52% of our survey respondents also felt that they're not coping well with not seeing family and friends, and the impact this has on isolation and feelings of feelings of isolation and the impact on their mental health. At the time of surveying, young people were asked to describe in one word how they felt at that time, with the top three most common responses being anxious, annoyed and frustrated. And I think that's safe to say that a lot of people in society are feeling them feelings. In terms of key issues on this topic, underfunding and access to vital services is key here. CAMS waiting lists are extensive and the impact of COVID has just made this dire situation even worse. 
there needs to be more recognition that loneliness and isolation are also experienced by young people and that's stereotypically of the older generations or adults. And we also believe that there needs to be greater moves needed towards challenging stigma and around, around mental health and embracing the mental, a mental health curriculum in educational settings, um, both in formal education but in informal education, as suggested by the Elephant Room Campaign. On the topic of physical health, 30% of respondents selected physical health as a key issue for them, with 63% of respondents suggesting that sports should not be stopped during a lockdown. 12% of respondents had questions around health, including the vaccine, and 10% of our survey respondents that were young people com that completed our survey reported their key issues included food, feeling unsafe in their homes, housing rights and homelessness. 10% seems minimal, but when you think of that in the bigger picture, that's over 270 young people highlighting this as a key issue. And the fact that it's young people um, identifying this as an issue we feel is extra significant in that. Young people also identified concerns around the health of those around them and their role in ensuring that these people are kept safe and well during this time. Young people have the added pressure of making sure that the people around them are safe and well. Key issues in relation to physical health include the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 31, the right to play, which has previously been mentioned, and the impact of this during, um, due to the restrictions that have been in place. The lack of and access to green spaces, particularly those for those who live in high-rise flats and crowded urban areas. In relation to physical health, there is also an impact on mental well-being when there are restrictions on physical activity and the ability to engage with others. The link between physical and mental health in relation to body image and confidence has been spoken about also within the survey. Um, one other um, point is around screen fatigue and the overrun of life online, with it being hard to find a break because life has altered to an online platform. Um, but I'll pass on to Jack to finish off our presentation. Hi, I'm Jack. I'm 14 and I've been with NIYF for two years. I'm going to start off with education. Some of the key statistics about education from our survey are 45% of survey respondents voiced that they felt unsafe in their workspace or educational environment. 35% of questions asked by survey respondents were around the topic of education. 47% of survey respondents felt that universities or colleges should be teaching more online. Now, it's important to note here that the definition of young people in Northern Ireland is under 25. So our survey statistics do encompass people who are in universities and colleges. And then our last statistic for education is 51% of respondents suggest that schools should be closed for longer. Although the survey was completed in November, so this last statistic may not show how young people are feeling now. Some of the key issues for young people in education include the widening inequalities. This includes access to resources and support. The digital divide. This being that some people may not have access to internet or may live in a crowded home where internet is low. The pressures of homeschooling. This includes people who are having to teach themselves because of parents having to work, but also includes some young people may have to homeschool their own children, which may increase pressures on them and also the confusion around exams and the inconsistencies of the grading system. Now we move on to youth voice and participation. Some of the main statistics include 89% of respondents felt that the voice of young people has not been heard throughout COVID-19. 74% told us that they did not have faith and confidence in leadership from government. In this question, we did not specify whether it was the Northern Irish government or the British government, so we're taking this as a collective of the both of them. Also, 58% said they did not fully understand the messages coming from people in power. And then 55% went on to say that they did not fully understand restrictions, rules and regulations. Some of the key issues from young people was the youth press conference. NAYF had a press conference scheduled in July last year, but was cancelled last minute. But we were told it would be rescheduled, but is yet to do so. We acknowledged the Cool FM Youth Press Conference, but we felt it was directed at primary school age children and did not fully answer questions and help with concerns of young people. Although we also believe that a youth press conference can't be a one off. There needs to be a long term mechanism for young people to be heard and consulted upon. We also want to highlight Article 12 of the UNCRC. 
stating the child shall in particular be provided the opportunity to be heard in any judicial and administrative proceedings affecting the child. Thank you for inviting us here today. It's great to get our message across. Thanks so much, Lauren and Jack. Um, really important contribution. Thank you, Jack. You're brave keeping that Liverpool flag on your wall under current circumstances as well. Well done. I'm not a Liverpool fan, but I, I, I respect the loyalty there. Well done. <laughs> okay. Could I now bring in our representatives from Pure Mental, please? Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Jay. I'm one of the co-founders and directors of Pure Mental. And I'd like to just say on behalf of Pure Mental, I'd like to thank you for inviting us to speak. So we look forward to talking to you about the school restart and the impact it's had on young people's mental health and COVID generally, and we take your questions on it. But first of all, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on Pure Mental. So Matty, uh, who we'll speak to you in a moment, and I set up Pure Mental back in summer 2019, and this was in between our lower and upper sixth years of school. Throughout the 13 years of education we had had before that, mental health was something that didn't really come up in school. There was little awareness, little education on it. And on top of this, there was a growing stigma. There were growing rates of poor mental health for young people and suicide. And particularly in the Lisburn area where we went to school, so we thought, it looks like few, few others are doing anything about this, so let's do something ourselves. Throughout all our projects, whether it be physical resources for schools, people like committees or the newly launched Young People's Wellbeing Council, policy and research have been a constant priority for us. And through this policy and research work, we've been able to consult with teachers, school leaders, and gather the voices of young people on a huge range of key issues. As we've gathered this information, evaluated decisions by the executive, we've been able to create our own informed and substantiated conclusions, which we'll be pleased to share with you this morning. When it comes to, to school restart, young people are on what we might call a seesaw of emotions, with a real contrast between fear and excitement being a very common theme um, from our consultation. Young people have been one of the groups in our society who have sacrificed a lot during this COVID crisis. Um, I think all members here today can acknowledge that um, education is power. And when called upon, young people sacrifice their friendships, their relationships, and indeed their education and stayed at home, often to protect their loved ones. Young people have paid a huge price for the disruption to their education this year, and that must be acknowledged by the members of this committee. Through detailed and lengthy consultation with staff and principals at both primary and secondary level, along with the views of young people themselves, it's clear that the school restart is sparking valid and genuine concerns surrounding the examinations, COVID transmission, and issues of motivation and concentration triggered by the return to face-to-face -to -face teaching, which has been highlighted by previous speakers today. But it's also important to highlight the problems surrounding the social aspect of school. Many young people have been cut off from anyone but those living in their immediate household since Christmas, and I'll include myself there. Uh, pupils are telling us that they may not be too accustomed to online learning, and feel extremely anxious about being thrown back into noisy classrooms with 30 students at a time, and that they may struggle managing social overstimulation by being reunited with their friends and having the increasing pressure of delivering essay after essay after essay. And there's a real, very clearly, de clearly defined fear of the unknown among young people and a very worrying, almost universal admission of social concerns surrounding friendships. And it's for that reason that we, we choose to echo the words of the mental health champion when she insists that education must be placed upon the back burner in favour of re-establishing friendships and social support structures that are so important to our young people. In our view, mental health has never been the highest priority for this department. And if they do not do so now, the ramifications among our young people could be insurmountable. Um, for primary school pupils, there, there are children who enrolled in P1 last year that have never met with another child their age. The key building blocks of friendships, emotional regulation, language and empathy have been disrupted. And there are real concerns among the primary school principals we have communicated with that unless proper planning is taken, the effects may be irreversible. And I'll hand over to Theo now to talk a bit about the physical impact upon students upon the return of his to his teaching. Brilliant, thanks Matthew. Um, 
This fear and anxiety are only added to with the threat to physical health. Uh, small schools in particular really struggle to follow the Department of Education's guidance on social distancing. Corridor distancing, mask wearing, staying two metres apart and rigorous cleaning. This is hard to enforce with these small schools, particularly when they have limited funds. For some pupils, going back to school now simply isn't an option, uh, particularly pupils who care for vulnerable relatives or themselves are shielding. Pupils have been forced to stay at home for months now, having been told that meeting with their friends puts lives in danger. Yet now they're being told by Peter Weir and Robin Swan that being in a small classroom with 30 other peers is totally fine. Maybe this doesn't endanger the physical health of pupils that much. But what about their teachers or their vulnerable family members? Is it really fair to put this burden of risk on young people who fear bringing home or passing on this deadly virus? That's the fear that young people are engaging with and children are engaging with. It's the negative side of things in this pandemic and for school teaching. But as we said, there is also a real incredible excitement about the return. Routine and being with friends are the two things the most uh, mentioned by pupils. They want, the, in normality, they want these to come together and to combat against a turbulent and unpredictable year and bring them a sense of normality like they would have in past years. Looking forward to seeing my friends again is what we've heard over and over again from young people when we've spoken to them about this. Young people need a social life again, whether that be in school or around friends. For young people with troubled home backgrounds who perhaps don't have a lot of stability in the home, school is a really key part of their mental health support structure. And I'm going to pass over to Jay now. Thank you. A routine has been absent from the lives of nearly everybody in the past 12 months. I need a routine to stay motivated and focused. These are the words of an SEM pupil who says they lack motivation, organisation and enthusiasm for their schoolwork without a routine. It's key for them. Generally, there is an excitement and a hope that a routine will bring back some normality and consistency. It may seem strange, perhaps, but young people miss school days. Most feel lost without them. The transfer process, online learning, exam uncertainty, the separation from friends and the constant worry about the virus itself. COVID has had a huge impact on young people's mental health, particularly as schools reopen. These are issues, these issues are so important for young people and all pupils, P1 to year 14, have, had, have been seriously impacted and we'll happily take questions on these in a few minutes. Finally, um, we'd like to touch on the fact that throughout the pandemic, the, the Department of Education has has failed to safeguard viable or, or realistic planning for very predictable solutions until the last second, with plans often being scrapped and frantically replaced as a result. Whether it's the, the exam situation, as I'm sure we're all aware of, or the recent reports of the squeeze of secondary school places, um, despite these numbers being available for nearly 11 years where you can track pupils in year groups, the department still doesn't have an answer to this question at this time. Um, we hope that as schools restart, the department does have a plan. However, upon recent communication with the Department of Education, and, and I acknowledge the chair's contribution here, um, regarding elements of the newly announced mental health framework, uh, which serves in our view as a glorified wish list rather than an actual plan of services and, and lacking detail almost entirely, um, we sort of beg to differ there. Um, to highlight our frustration on behalf of those whom we are representing today, um, last Thursday, primary school principals received a 40-page document on school restart um, and that gives principals just one working day to read, analyze and communicate this plan with parents and staff. We feel this is unacceptable and um, as schools return, as we've said, catch up must be priority number two and education must be placed upon the back burner and well-being must be priority number one. Thank you very much and we'll happily take any questions that you have. Thank you so much to everybody that has presented today. Um, I'm, I'm not remotely surprised that it has been both inspirational and challenging in equal measure. Um, and I, I'm just thinking on, on some of the testimony that, that has been given today. Um, it, it is hard uh, and challenging listening. Um, if, you, if you've made a, a word cloud of, of the contributions today, I'm hearing uncertainty, 
anxiety, distress, inequality, digital divide, sacrifice, disruption, isolation, shielding, mental health, child and adolescent mental health services, exams by the back door, field planning, and perhaps most challenging, failure to include you in decisions about you and that affect you. And we need to hopefully use today as a, a platform and a launch pad to make in major improvements in, in that regard. I also heard inspirational advocacy, right to education, right to play, right to health, right to have a voice, right to inclusion in decisions affecting you communications, regular youth press conference, access to green space, safety, funding, excitement. Um, we have got to be advocates on your behalf to make sure that is the, is the, the story that you experience um, in, the, in the months coming ahead. And we have been calling on the education minister and on the executive to put in place a children and young people's recovery plan that focuses on educational, emotional, social and, and physical support for children and young people uh, coming out of this pandemic. So we will do all we can to support you and we're so grateful for your engagement with our committee today. Uh, delighted to bring in the members of our committee now at this point to engage with you and ask questions. So can I start with Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, MLA? Thank you, Chair, and uh, I want to say thanks to all the panellists for their inspiring presentations this morning. And, uh, you know, many, many of the themes that were raised were common right across all the presentations. But one of the things I was struck by was uh, in, in the presentation from Inez and from Theo, that fear that young people have when they go back to school of bringing a deadly virus back into their own homes and to maybe a vulnerable member of their family. I mean, and that's an unacceptable burden to place on the shoulders of any young person. So uh, I just wanted to raise that issue. And uh, one of you also mentioned the mental health champion and some of the things that she has been saying. And she gave evidence to us some weeks ago on the committee and agreed with, with my assessment that there's a, a tsunami of mental health and well-being issues coming at us and that there was a need, as most of you have said, to prioritise well-being uh, above uh, education uh, and, and above learning for the time being. Uh, and I, I have a concern that the department may place an over-reliance on the new mental health and well-being framework, uh, which mostly was designed pre-COVID uh, and doesn't really take account of this pandemic. And, I mean, I believe that there should be a, a coherent and integrated uh, strategy developed across the departmental strategy between the health, education, community, involving the community and voluntary sector and, sp uh, and sporting organizations and so on, uh, so that there's a specific response to this tsunami of, of, uh, of, of mental health and well-being issues uh, that's going to be coming at us. And I'm just wondering, would, would the panelists agree that we need a COVID-specific response uh, to these particular issues? Thanks. Thanks, Pat. I'll do my best to uh, bring people that want to answer in, but I've got quite a few capable responders <laughs> to choose from here this morning. If people maybe want to physically raise their hand or use the hand raise facility, I'll do my best to bring you in. I think I can see everybody. We'll start with Morgan. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, in a meeting with um, Pure Mental and Siobhan O'Neill, uh, only last Friday we were actually talking about this and about how counselling should be... Um, brought in through uh, sort of it should be digitized through the use of Zoom and the like. Uh, just speaking from speaking with people, hundreds if not thousands of people have had to stop their CAMS treatments because they um, 
didn't want to do it over the phone or over Zoom, my brother included. And that's just unacceptable that they should be stopping treatment just because they're refusing to do it over the phone, which is even, you know, even at all extremely ineffective. And Crisis Cafe, I'm sure, are in a better um, sort of position to answer this, but they've been doing an amazing job with weekly <clears throat> uh, group sessions on Zoom and Zoom uh, crisis counseling as well throughout the pandemic. Okay, uh, can I bring in Inez, please? Thanks. Um, is my mic on? Yeah, thank yes. you very much, Morgan, for raising that as well. And um, like I said, we work directly with young people, and we try to see what's going on. And we've seen that with the pandemic, COVID has changed the way we look at mental health, and in fact, it's increased the mental problems that we see in young people. We don't have the exact statistics, but we said that our calls and our consultations have over doubled over the pandemic, and. We need a different framework. We need an emergency COVID mental health framework that addresses the problems that this pandemic has brought up and addresses the increase in demand for mental health services. Um, and we need it now because it's affecting people as we speak. We get calls every day at the cafe. People just feel disempowered and they feel more open to. Um, so that's our answer from the crisis cafe. Thank you very much. The chair seems to have disappeared, Evie. <laughs> okay, I'm back. I'm back. I, I, I have I have about two uh, dropouts per session, but the uh, assembly broadcasting get me back in reasonably quickly every now and again. There's a delay. Um, thanks so much for that. Can I bring uh, Lauren in, please? Yeah, um, I just wanted to touch on absolutely. There, the, life has never been like this before, so the fact of bringing in a policy or framework that implement when this hasn't been considered is just, well, frankly, I feel it's ridiculous. Um, but also across the departmental um, approach in re response to this is absolutely fatal. I, I spoke before about food poverty and digital divide. You know, it, this goes across every department in terms of rights and young people's rights. So it needs to be key in moving forward. Thanks, Lauren. Pat? Yes, uh, thank, thanks for that. And I also wanted to ask uh, the representative from sorry, the sorry, Pat. Sorry to cut across your Pat. I miss Bruna there. Apologies. I'll bring Bruna in, and then I'll come back to you, Pat. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. I just wanted to say that the pandemic has affected everyone. So even people who had mental health issues before they have maybe gotten worse because of the pandemic or people who have never experienced mental health issues have now suddenly got anxiety about seeing people they feel depressed because they're so isolated so i think absolutely we need to prioritize young people's mental health by uh seeing how the pandemic has affected them specifically thanks bruna pat Thanks, thanks, Chair. And uh, I probably should have said from the outset that uh, I'm a father of two primary school children, uh, one in P1 who just went back this week and the other one who's in P5. She'll be nine in a couple of weeks' time. And I can definitely see the impact that this pandemic and the lockdown has had on them. The, the younger child who's just gone back is really shy and, and really needs that help in terms of social development. Uh, whereas the, the older one is much more outgoing and is really depressed that she can't see her friends and mingle in school. She, she, she loves school. So, uh, I mean, don't think that we, because we're politicians, are oblivious to the problems that young people are facing. Uh, many of us are parents and uh, and, and, and we understand the, the issues that are being faced. I just wanted to ask a, a question about the, the, the paper that the secondary schools union provided to us uh, captured the frustration of young people, uh, particularly around the dithering of the minister when it came to the exams last year. And there are now new problems this year in regard to the... the one of the comments that was made earlier was that it looks like there are going to be exams by the back door. And 
I'm wondering, could panelists from the the the, the uh, secondary schools union tell us what impact the various delays and indecision by the minister uh, have had on the young people that you represent? Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Is it okay if I come in here then, Chair? Yeah, I think Morgan was itching as well there, Cormac, <laughs> but go ahead and I'll get Morgan in as well if I can. Thanks. Um, so one of the things we actually, uh, in our mental health report, have noted as one of the key findings is that poor communication from the executive on decisions like school closures um, had really negatively impacted the mental health of young people. And that was something we found not only through the survey results, but in individual focus group sessions as well. And the uncertainty from the executive on decision making and, you know, in particular from the education minister and the delay in decision making was really having an impact. I mean, I think one of the key figures from this survey is that 84% of young people told us that that um, exam uncertainty, exam uncertainty had negatively impacted their mental health. That is entirely avoidable. For if our education minister had have acted decisively along with the Welsh education minister, Kirsty Williams, in November, when SSUNI and the Children's Commissioner called on him to, to do so, to cancel exams, we could have avoided the situation that so many of our young people were in until January. And uh, in the report, you'll see we, we do outline what date each sort of region of the UK cancelled exams. And as per usual, Northern Ireland is lagging behind everyone else. We're not, I mean, I mean, we have devolution for a reason. Why aren't we using devolution to give our young people peace of mind? And, you know, to answer your question there about, um, about the impact that that had on young people's mental health, it's been absolutely gigantic. Every single consultation we do, every nearly all the messages we open on social media, our young people asking us about mental health and saying, you know, well, what what are you doing about uh, exams and everything going forward? So that's why the CCA announcement that I've been really driving home today is so so worrying. I mean, if eighty four percent of students in November tell us that that their mental health being negatively impacted by exams, what will that be now? Now that GCSE students might have to do up to forty exams in a space of four weeks. The, I mean, some of this uh, guidance in that announcement from CCEA is out of touch with schools. Uh, it recommends the conditions for assessments being taken to have notice boards in classroom, in classrooms covered. I mean, I would challenge the committee to find a teacher in Northern Ireland who, when they run a class test, gets big sheets of paper and covers the notice boards in their room. And that's the conditions that they're demanding for evidence from teachers. And the idea that teachers would have to, for every student, provide four assessments done under those conditions forces students into, upon return from Easter, a blitzing of assessment. And, you know, we are here talking today a lot about mental health. And that's going to be dangerous for mental health of a lot of students. It's very dangerous to, to send students who've been, who've not had the same quality of learning they would have had in other years if they'd been at home, and send them into the most sort of violent stream of exams they could have gone. You know, I mean, even if we were doing exams in May and June, they wouldn't be under those sort of horrendous conditions. It's... I, I think that this guidance needs to be immediately altered to include things like homework, homework essays as being a part of the suggested evidence. And one of the key problems as well, I know that um, SSU and I have been working on this greatly in the past few days, is that students were told by the education minister that work completed during the lockdown would contribute to our grades. But now under CCEA's guidance that they've released on what makes good evidence, they say that that's not good evidence, work completed over lockdown. So, I mean, and it's been mentioned by other uh, people here today that they've poured over every essay they've submitted during lockdown, reread things five and six times, and that's a story across the board in Northern Ireland. Students have been working harder than ever during this lockdown to try and safeguard their grades. And now, after being told they would impact our final grade, CCEA on a Friday afternoon in March, they wouldn't. It's very demoralizing for young people, and it's very, very helpful to mental health, all the indecision and permanent back and forth. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm there, but it's very issue. No, I, I, just to come in, I, I realise how urgent and important these issues are, so I'm trying to be absolutely as flexible as I can today. And just as a note to members, given that we have prioritised this session today and taken no other evidence session today, we, we should have up to 10 minutes per member for questioning which puts you slightly over time, Pat, but I'll let you make a final comment. And I, and I think the issues that you're raising will be, will be raised by 
other members as well. So witnesses will get an opportunity, I think, to add to these to these thank, issues. Pat, well, thank, thanks for your indulgence, Chair. And just finally, I want to comment on the counselling service being provided in schools and even. Uh, Outside the context of this pandemic, the counselling service was unsatisfactory and quite a number of you have expressed your dissatisfaction with it and the inadequacy of it. And uh, I'm not even going to ask any of you to comment again because I, I can gather the thrust of your opinions from what has already been said. And it's, it's an issue that needs to be incorporated into uh, an overall comprehensive strategy on dealing with the fallout of this pandemic and the mental health issues that we're going to be facing in the time ahead. So thanks again to all of you for your contribution. It has been uh, very enlightening. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA, please? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to each of the young people uh, that have presented to us this morning. Absolutely uh, a wide range of talent uh, on, on show and for each of them, I, I feel quite certain that there's a bright future ahead for them in their careers, whichever way, whichever pathway they decide uh, to follow. I'm confident that uh, they will find a, a very positive uh, uh, pathway and, and, and a good future. I suppose uh, <clears throat> there are many, many things uh, in which I uh, do agree with them, uh, particularly with the uh, secondary school students uh, um, uh, and on page um, uh, the, the paragraph 4-1 uh, of, of, um, of their document around the coordinate and the fact of government working is required to address the mental health crisis in Northern Ireland. I think it would be the view, generally speaking, of, of, of the committee that this coordination is uh, absolutely critical. Um, within your document, you've mentioned DE and DOH. I, I think it would be certainly my view that we do need to go beyond DE and DOH, that we do need, first of all, to have a budget established by the finance minister for the return to school. That obviously has to come from uh, proposals or leadership from the Education Committee for the Education Minister. It needs to be supported and agreed by the Health Minister. And I would argue also it needs to be supported and agreed uh, by the Communities Minister. I think if we are going to see an effective return, a uh, safe return uh, and a very positive return to school to address many of the uh, problems that uh, have been outlined to us this morning, then we may even need to consider um, whether or not we actually go beyond uh, the current school year, not potentially into the academic subjects, but maybe subjects dealing with uh, health issues uh, and perhaps even using or uh, being using schools as, as uh, places to meet, but uh, coordinating health activities around uh, the, uh, and within to the summer months. Because I've no doubt that the, the mental health issues that have been described by, by the young people um, are, are going to, to uh, raise their heads uh, over the next uh, number of, of weeks and months. Can I just ask you maybe a number of questions? And I would, I have to say, I would like to congratulate uh, Pure Mental um, in establishing their own group to, to address the issues. I think that's an initiative that is worthy of, of, of some, some comment. So thank you to, to them for, for, for doing that. In the, perhaps if I could follow with the secondary schools uh, delegates, um, perhaps you could outline to me what you see as the pathway to a return to school, return to qualifications, and uh, how you might expect those qualifications to be considered uh, by the universities, uh, either in the Republic or in the GB. 
Okay, again, if, if members want to physically, or sorry, witnesses want to physically raise their hand or use the hand raise facility in Starleaf, I'll, I'll do my best to, to bring you in. Who wants to come in first there? Cormac? Yeah, yeah go yeah, ahead. Okay, if, yeah. if I come in here, and then if Morgan could maybe answer the member on this, on the note about using skills over the summer for mental health and well-being as a meeting place, because that's something we have given a lot of thought to. Um, but just on qualifications, um, you know, we've heard a lot about portability of qualifications this year from the initial ministerial announcement in October, which did very little for young people, and that was the circumstances under which our survey was done under that first announcement in October about the omission of one unit of GCSE. Um, but as far as port uh, portability of qualifications go, I mean, I don't. I think that universities know teachers well enough to know to trust them. And I think that one thing that is lacking from the announcement that we've seen this week is trust in the professional judgment of teachers. And I feel like it's Groundhog Day and that I'm back last August and I'm talking about the need to trust teachers' judgment instead of an algorithm, except instead of an algorithm, it's an onslaught of assessment this year. So I, I do believe that universities will take into account the grades that teachers give, should teachers give out grades, but I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say that there should be no evidence attached to these grades. Students have a right to know what their grades are based on, but I don't believe the system that's been put in right now is the correct one. A, a better system would be expanding the definition of evidence to include homework essays and I, I homework essays and classwork. And that is something that I think universities can stand over as qualifications and then allowing teachers to sort of use their own discretion and professional judgment to alter the grades that they've maybe given and say, well, I know that this student is sitting on a B, high B this year based on the evidence that I have, but I know that any other year without a lockdown, without school closures, without other circumstances associated with the pandemic, this student would have got an A. Teachers deserve this year the right to give students an A. And it goes back to something that SIC and I have really been saying all year, which is that no one complained when we introduced the furlough scheme to give our workers a hand up through 2020 and 2021. So why do we have such opposition to giving students an educational furlough and giving them a hand up through 2020 and 2021? So that was what we used in the argument we used in August for the scrapping of the algorithm. And it's what we use now for the reform of this system that's here announced on Friday afternoon. Does that Thanks, answer thanks Cormac. Yeah, th thanks Cormac. I'm, I'm going to have to keep trying to get other people in as well. You're, yeah. Your answers are extremely helpful, and um, I want to make sure I, I get some other people in as well. Can I bring in Bruna on that? Hi. Uh, I just wanted to say that as uh, we do go back to school, I'm year 13, so I will be going back on March 22nd. Um, I think we just need some sort of guarantee that the day we go back to school, or even the days that we first go back to school, aren't we aren't just going to be like bombarded with so many assessments uh, because I think for a lot of people during the pandemic where we've had online school a lot of people have been really demotivated and they've been uh, unable to complete all the work they've had to spend a lot of time on it because it's just really stressful for them and they maybe don't understand what teachers are teaching them and for us to go back on March 22nd and then have all of our classes set us assessments for that day when we went weeks without uh, having the having to do things like that I think that'll be really stressful for everyone and especially if these are assessments that are determining determining our grade we need to have uh, practice beforehand we need to know when they'll be and we can't just be the day we come back after being months out of school thanks Bruno Robin yeah thank you chair and thank you for for, for the answers uh, maybe could I turn to crisis calf um, and, and particularly because uh, I have to say to crisis calf I had not heard of you before um, um, uh, and maybe if you could explain to me just a little bit around the work that you do. Uh, I assume you're not open at the moment. Um, we Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Robin. I'll bring in the uh, Crisis Cafe representatives. Okay. We, know you, we, we know you now. <laughs> Go ahead, and yes, thank you. 
Um, thank you very much, Robin. I completely understand that we're actually, we are a physical place, so we've only been able to open so far in South Africa and Yuri, and we're looking at hopefully other opening in other um, places. And yes, one, sorry to cut across you. Can I, can I ask everyone to, who isn't speaking to go on mute so that we can hear uh, each other as clearly as possible? Thanks. Sorry. Um, all right. Um, yeah, so we work in Uri and South Armagh so far. And like you said, we have had to close due to the pandemic just for public health concerns. But before the pandemic, we did friendship cafes. So it was kind of like a social space for young people to come and meet in a safe environment. And um, because there really is no social life for young people with the pandemic, and that has a great impact on their mental health. Um, and as well as that, we did drop-in services on a Sunday. It was similar to the Friendship Cafe. It was probably less people, though, so that people could come and until they felt comfortable, and maybe they could ask for the one-to-one -one support that they need. Um, but now that we are online, we have had to pivot, like I'm sure all the rest of the organisations here have today. Um, we came up with an idea in January to do a self-care calendar, because, you know, it's in January people focus on New Year's resolutions and needing to change themselves. But as young people, we know that we're amazing just the way we are. So we decided this self-care calendar, um, each theme would, each week would be a different theme. And it would be daily posts of activities, reflections, quotes and things to help young people take care of themselves during the lockdown. Um, as well as that, we do a live on a Friday. And this has just really been taken up by our ambassadors and the young people that we represent. Um, myself and Oren and, and the Youth Advisory Board did the first four weeks. I myself spoke on body image. Um, but then from then, it's just it's really taken off. We've had ambassadors come forward with ideas, young people wanting to talk about, for example, um, gender and identity expression. Um, as well as that, we've talked about isolation and loneliness, anxiety, and other topics such as self-empowerment. Um, and as well as that, we're still offering Zoom consultations and phone calls if anyone needs. And as I said, this need has just doubled during the pandemic. People's mental health is really suffering during lockdown. Um, and we're also empowering our young people and giving them skills and training. We do boxer size classes on a Wednesday with a local young person who runs her own fitness blog. Um, and we also do zooms and consultations we had a dietitian we've also had someone who's doing a talk on sleeping and how to improve your sleeping habits um, and it's just been really beneficial for the young people in the area it's given them a voice and it's given them an opportunity to learn new skills and meet new people and um, we're also doing friendship cafe we can't exactly do it in person but we're doing it on zoom many um cafes with our ambassadors and as well as that we're hosting social events such as the first crisis cafe quiz that was hosted about two weeks ago um, I hope that answers your question, but in short, we're looking forward to doing more things online and on social media until we can get back in person and see all the young people that we love working with. Well, thank, thank you for that, and uh, let's hope it is only a short time until we can get back up and, and return to whatever we are going to call normal uh, in the future. Uh, and thank you for the work. It's uh, extremely valuable uh, work. Can I maybe ask uh, Nikki if they would maybe make some comments? You, you, you spent a fair bit of time around talking about the, the, the need um, uh, around the activities of calms um, uh, and uh, that it's difficult, obviously, for young people to deal with uh, calms or, over, over the phone. Uh, and I think we would all, all accept that. Uh, it's difficult for, for in all sorts of fields to deal with issues that we really should be dealing with in a face-to-face, -face, but having to deal with them uh, over the phone or, or, or by this channel that we are using today. If it's not going to be over the phone, how would you see it uh, being addressed? Um, and and uh, can I ask you maybe to comment around the impact on the effectiveness of uh, online remote learning. Thanks, Robin. I need to make that your final question. Thank you. And bring in the, the Nikki representatives. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to answer the question about CAMS. Um, I think if there was a way that we could not have all CAMS appointments over the phone, I would think it would work better, such as having a uh, like in real life appointments with whoever your CAMS worker is, but have that not as regular as phone appointments. And maybe just maybe once a month you get to meet up with your 
webcams work or in real life you get to see them face to face and then if there's any checkup appointments in between that can continue on the phone but I just think it's really hard to connect with a cams worker over the phone you're not seeing what they look like you can't build a connection and a lot of people have trouble speaking over the phone and if they have some sort of social anxiety that may make it really difficult for them and I also think uh, in regards to cams uh, obviously I understand they're very overwhelmed at the moment since so many young people have had mental health problems during the pandemic but I think there should be more um, communication between CAMS and maybe other mental health services or uh, knowledge about a previous medical history because I know uh, I had a CAMS appointment and when they phoned me uh, I had already got the issue that they phoned me about sorted and they had been contacted about that but they had never read over it and so uh, it just felt really, um, uh, it, it uh, just felt like a really pointless phone call and it was really hard to uh, be uh, trusting of CAMS after that since they showed no knowledge of my medical history. Uh, if I just pass over to Tizi, if she wants to talk about the online learning part of the question. Thanks, Bruna. So I think that remote learning has been amazing in some schools and other schools are failing. Uh, there's, it's very, there's been no structure for teachers. They're not given what they're expected to do. There's not a certain amount of calls they're supposed to have a week. It's all teacher-based. And I think not having the a framework for teachers has been really hard for them and us. It doubles their ro workload and it doubles ours. We have some classes where you're in a call every day. We have some classes where you're not in a call until like a Friday. So you're set work and you're not really sure what you're doing or if it's right. And it's very hard to find the support. Remote learning in this time has been amazing because when we can't go to school, at least there is some connection to our teachers and some connection to our education, but it's not enough. Uh, School-based learning is not we can appreciate it more. You need to have those times where you can talk to your teacher one-on-one, -on -one, stay back after class if you're a bit confused about a topic. It's that type of relationship that you can build with your teacher in person that allows you to be vulnerable and start trying to challenge yourself more. And I think that's been harder during lockdown as we're given so much work set and like an assignment. They just work through and when you're done, you're done. There's no communication about if you're struggling on a certain topic and there's no recapping there's no making sure that children are, are okay with the content they're learning it's trying to get through a really long specification that hasn't been cut down enough we're still expected to do the same amount of work even though we have far less class time far less experience in the topic we are starting new subjects that we're not completely sure of and we're still trying to work out how exam boards will mark it and we're trying to learn specifications and uh, mark schemes and there's not enough support that we would have got in class there's no opportunity for us to really speak right and put your hand up uh, because you don't want to interfere in other people's learning because everyone's having a hard time so it's more if you have a social anxiety disorder speaking out is being made far more impossible almost because if you're in a large class of 30 people on a zoom call there's no real chance to put your hand up and say, wait, can you can you talk about that a bit more? Can you rephrase that? It's just been really hard, but I think teachers have done an amazing job considering the lack of framework they have. They, they have to figure it out for themselves. An entire new way of teaching that they weren't taught, that they have no okay. experience in, and they've been thrown in at the deep end. Thanks, Tizzy. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Robin. Just looking forward to going back to school, Tizzy. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to each and every one of our young people who are here today. It's not a very easy thing to come on to such a public forum and to speak so honestly and openly and, might I say, very articulately about this, the situation that, that you have all 
uh, faced. This year, without a doubt, has been uh, most difficult for young people, more so than anyone else in our society. Everything we know to be natural has been taken away and removed and replaced with barriers uh, and reasons not to engage with each other. It, it, it goes against everything that we do on a daily basis. And I know that young people in particular uh, are struggling and continue to struggle and have, con and have, have struggled to adapt uh, as well uh, because there's all sorts of issues. That this isn't specific to one part of Northern Ireland or one particular household or one particular person. Uh, there's unique circumstances that we're all met with depending on our own uh, individual circumstances, uh, be it that we live in rural communities or we live in cities or, or, or so on and so forth, and depending on how far apart we live uh, from friends and even family members in some instances, particularly if you're an only child. So there's serious issues uh, that do exist. And can I say that uh, every, everyone has spoken very, very clearly and honestly, and I want to thank you for that and keep doing that. The power uh, of your voices as young people is, is very important uh, and it needs to be heard at the centre. And I think this is a fantastic forum and a very good uh, starting point uh, for you to, 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 to do that. And you've done great work to date. Uh, just in relation to exams, now a number of you have mentioned exams, and most of you will know that this is a real sore point for me. Uh, I have went uh, to uh, extreme measures to try and hold the minister and see uh, to account over their messing uh, over the course of the last year. A lot of the stress and anxiety burdened on young people have been caused because of a lack of leadership or understanding by SIA and the minister, both who are out of touch with young people and with reality. And that, unfortunately, as direct and as honest as that is, is what has happened here. We as politicians have two choices. We can lead from the front or we can sit at the back. And all along throughout this pandemic, too many of executive ministers at Stormont were sitting at the back of the bus when they should have been driving it. And that is not acceptable because as a consequence of that, you as young people have suffered as a result of that field leadership. And might I say, uh, SIA, SIA as an organization, a self-regulated out-of-touch organization are not learning from any of their mistakes. They have put a huge and immense amount of pressure on you all over the course of the last year. It's unforgivable. And we have pulled them over the coals on this and hoped that they would learn lessons. But clearly, from the message sent out on a Friday night, more recently, they've learned nothing. Uh, and I want to put that very firmly in right. There's a number of questions that I have, but uh, Robin and Pat have touched on them. But I just want to ask in relation to uh, counselling services. So, and I've made this point slightly in, in my opening remarks. So 42% of students felt comfortable using their school's counselling services, a low uh, figure, in my opinion, given the, the complexity of the challenges faced by young people today. But that, that has worsened uh, during COVID uh, completely because there's just no access to services, particularly for you students who don't think we live in rural communities. So um, ju just in relation to the, the level of young people who uh, felt that uh, the, the, the low level of young people who felt comfortable with the service, why do you think that figure is so low? Is it because younger people are finding it more difficult to speak out? Or is it because there isn't sufficient access to the support services that are so necessary uh, during these times? And, and I'm happy for everyone to come on that. Thanks for that, Daniel. As I say, if witnesses want to indicate by way of a uh, uh, raised hand on Starleaf um, or physical one as well, and I think we'll have Inez there uh, from the Crisis Cafe. Hi, um, thank you very much. That's a very, very reasonable question, and it's something that we find in our work as well. Crisis Cafe offers counselling services, and we're doing it in a, in a clinical way, in a non-clinical space. But anytime any charity has to step in, surely that's a sign that it's not working and that we need to change. Um, I actually have the statistics on this as well. In a survey that we conducted, 47.2% said that the schools don't have accessible um, mental health services and 35.4% said that it was only sometimes. Um, and our respondents also said that 91.8% of young people want there to be mental health services in schools five days a week. Because like Orrin said, it's not like you can go to a counsellor and they'll say, oh, you have an appointment with the counsellor, but it won't be today. It might be next week. It might be in a few weeks. And that's just not fair on young people. We need to see more mental health services in schools. We always heard them, but with COVID-19, we've seen the increase in mental health problems. And we need to address that increase with an, 
a new framework and more mental health um, services. It's great that charities like Mrs. Cafe are able to reach out to young people. And I say that not as a representative, but as a young person who has been helped by Crisis Cafe through their social interactions and their um, empowering young people. And I think we just need to do more. We need to have more mental health services because for some young people, it's a matter of life and death. Um, if Oren from the Crisis Cafe would like to speak on this as well. Yeah, I'll bring Oren in and then uh, Bruna as well. Yeah, just kind of reiterating on some of the points and as made about the access. That figure is already low as it is, and it will be much lower once we return to school on March 22nd. Students will be coming into school and they will have work thrown at them with no time to consider how they have felt over the lockdown period. And they'll be coming in to start with more work, more thrown at them, which is going to lead to more increased stress and anxiety. We need a total reassessment of this when we return to come up with this beforehand. Thanks, Warren. Can I bring in uh, Bruna then from the Children's Commissioner Youth Panel? Thanks, Bruna. Yeah, um, thank you. I just wanted to say that having a good counselling service in schools is so important because it's so accessible to all the young people who are in that school. However, I know people from other schools and from my own school who have went to counselling services that are provided by school and they thought it just did not help at all. They thought that the counsellors were not really listening to them, that they hadn't maybe been properly trained in how to deal with problems, which is why at the beginning I mentioned about how the Education Authority Youth Service has an obligation to support young people. And I think that they should be providing more support in schools to not only support the young people, but also support the teachers who want to help young people through mental health problems, but don't know how. I think that uh, the youth service would be able to provide young people with maybe developing stronger coping mechanisms, maybe uh, helping manage their emotions and their stress levels in school. And I think they could maybe also provide some sort of training for teachers to be able to have more knowledge on young people's mental health. Thanks, Bruno. Daniel? That, that, Sorry, that's right. Daniel Lauren wanted to come in briefly as well. I'll, I'll, I'll take that into consideration in terms of time. Daniel, Lauren from the Youth Forum. Sorry for cutting across there. You're um, okay. Yes, I just wanted to jump on there. Um, in terms of school and environment and providing counselling services, that can be very uncomfortable for a young person. Um, I know in my secondary school, it was in an office off the side of the main reception. You know, that's not particularly a comfortable environment for young people to access this much needed vital support, which can leave them vulnerable. Like I know there's sometimes young people that leave counselling sessions crying and that's that's great that they express emotions in that setting, but it's also not um, totally positive to make sure that there's not a good environment for that. Um, and also just during this time, in terms of the digital divide and access, particularly for young people and young people who um, lack access to resources and due to digital poverty. I know that's something the committee's been looking at, but I think it's important to always reiterate that. Thanks, Lauren. Daniel? Ch Chair, those are very critical points. And one thing I, I want to draw from this is uh, uh, one of the one, one of the, or, or young people mentioned uh, that uh, some of those delivering counselling services aren't properly trained. I would argue absolutely there's a need for greater training, but I'd equally argue there's a, a need for greater awareness and training of the Department for Education and people of senior positions of leadership, including the Minister and the Education Authority, uh, because if you look at the actions or inactions or indecision over the last year, they have given no uh, 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 show no understanding of the challenges uh, uh, faced by young people or the burden placed on them. Uh, and to, to be very clear about this, the mental health crisis uh, is the pandemic that we are going through as a society that the government are not doing enough about. And this is going to get worse as a consequence of this virus. Uh, and, and we're banging at the door. I've seen how people in my own community of all walks of life of all ages have been impacted. Uh, and, 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 and I understand completely how young people uh, have been affected this because I had coronavirus as one of the, it was the first MLA to have coronavirus. Uh, and I was at home for over two weeks. And, and I tell you, it tests you beyond belief when you're uh, imprisoned, if you like, within uh, your own home with very little to do and uh, uh, poor connectivity 
So there's 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 serious issues afoot, and, and young people absolutely have been impacted. Just a, a chair, uh, I know we're taking up time, but just a, another question uh, that I wanted to touch on, um, and it's uh, let me see if we find it here. It's jotted down earlier. Um, yeah, uh, just, for, just when you're looking for that, Daniel, I'll be bringing Robbie Butler in next if Robbie wants to get yeah. ready. There, go ahead, Daniel. Uh, and enabling children and young people to navigate a safe route to recovery from mental health issues generated by the lockdown, as I've touched on, many have advocated significant participation in activities that bring young people together, including sporting activities. Considering there's uh, less female participation in sports, um, is there a better way that we can ensure the needs of females uh, are, are targeted better? Uh, and uh, in particular, is there a way that this committee uh, could assist? I think this is an important point, uh, particularly uh, a few days after International uh, Women's Day. I, I think this is an important point uh, that needs to be addressed. But just before I let an answer, I want to thank you all for what you're doing. I want you to continue speaking loudly and clearly and be honest and blunt and direct and make no apology for that to any politician or any person uh, in a position of responsibility that can affect change in your lives. Stand up, speak out and keep doing what you should do. Thanks, Daniel. Who would like to come in on that? I'm going to bring someone in otherwise. <laughs> do you want to, yeah, go ahead, Tacey. Thank you. I think it's important that other activities that aren't sports are provided, not just for women. Um, for everyone, not everyone is sporty, and that's a large way that schools try to do extracurriculars that don't often apply to everyone, and then they question why they don't have a student response from certain kids that aren't in sports that, and that are, aren't involving, but there isn't a way for us to be involved that isn't sports. So I think uh, adding an extra emphasis on extracurricular clubs or even just social clubs where kids can meet up in small groups or large groups just to have a conversation with each other is important and facilitating that is something that schools need to do more often for those of us who aren't sport sports people or athletes our athletes, I think it's important to give us an opportunity to reach out to our peers and see how they're doing, even if we ourselves are struggling. It's a nice way to bring a community together that isn't as stressful for some people. Really important, sure. Casey. Thank you. Yeah, Daniel. That very briefly. Uh, when I was a student in Liverpool, there was walk-in clinics, so where, uh, particularly through the university. So if you needed support, you're able to walk in, get seen, be heard, uh, and supported instantly. And I, I've muted this idea uh, uh, to uh, uh, ministers here in various questions. Given the situation we're facing with mental health in our society generally, particularly in young people, uh, would that be something that you would support? So walk-in services, a walk-in clinic where people can go in and instantly get support when they need them, because you can't book an appointment when, you're, when, when your mental health is in such a critical and vulnerable uh, place. Uh, I think it's important that people get that support at the point they need it, and therefore the only solution okay. is walk-in services. Okay. Easier for me to cut you off than them off, Daniel. Um, <laughs> so can I, can I bring in Sophia uh, Armstrong, who had raised her hand, and then uh, Lauren Macarivi? Thanks, Sophia. Yeah, um, walk-in services, like young people, it takes a lot for someone to come forward and say that they're struggling with their mental health. And then to be told if they're on the phone to the doctors or on the phone to the counselling service in school that, oh, you'll get an appointment in a few weeks' time. It's one thing actually making the appointment. It's another thing actually going. Having that young person make the decision in that moment that they're going to go to a walk-in service and be treated there and then is a big thing, but they're more likely to go to it then and there rather than waiting and being put off for longer and longer points of time and being put on longer and longer waiting lists like with CAMS. Thanks for that, Sophia. If I can bring in Lauren and then Brona. Thanks. Yeah, um, so as a youth organisation, um, young people do come to us for support, particularly during the pandemic. And before that, we are, um, we're open to supporting young people regardless. We're not trained professionals in that field, but a one-stop shop that deals with the issue right then and there when the young people need support, I think is vital. And hearing from Crisis Cafe shows the support that can be done in person um, and showing through that. Um, just in terms of looking beyond sport as well, um, as a youth work organisation, we use a range of methodologies and make sure young people are engaged, um, whether that's through sport, whether that's through group work, arts, creativity, 
whatever that might be to make sure young people are engaged and that's important in terms of using, using a youth-led process um but also like there is great campaigns within sport as well in terms of female representation just to note i'm not i'm tempted to ask a question but I'll just leave it as a comment instead given how much we get through but it, you, you get a sense that the creative ideas that you guys have the the organizations and the projects that you've uh, created yourselves um, are not always interacted with by schools. It's not necessarily a criticism of, of schools. It can be quite traditional institutions and, and networks at times in Northern Ireland. And I, I, the, you, you just wonder, is that level of engagement with your own ideas and your own projects that you're coming up with yourselves, are they being weaved into the extracurricular activity of our schools and our, our colleges, which you know are, is the place where you will spend most time at the end of the day. Um, I'll bring in Bruna, please, thanks. Yeah, um, I think walking services are such a great idea because it could be so beneficial for people who are too afraid to phone up their GP themselves and make an appointment or they don't have enough time to wait for a CAMS referral or even they're too afraid to open up to their family about their mental health and how they're struggling and they could just go there and get service uh, on their own uh, anytime they need it. I also just wanted to touch on what Tazy had mentioned earlier about other activities such as exercise. Um, uh, my school, I know uh, they've been trying to do a lot regarding mental health because they recognise that some young people are struggling and in previous years they have provided activities uh, for uh, entire year groups that are about mental health such as uh, there's a mindfulness club that was running online during online school and then a few years ago there was also something where they brought in like support animal dogs and so uh, year groups could have time spending uh, their lunch or something with them and I think something like that could be really beneficial because it would not only increase awareness of mental health but also provide young people with a service inside school where they could meet with others who may be struggling and work on coping mechanisms. Sounds really positive Bruna and, uh, and a, a good example of a creative response from a school. Daniel, do you want a very, very concise closing remark there before I move to Robbie? No, no, Chair, I, I'm, I'm quite happy. I, I just want to thank everybody for their contributions and to reach out to us individually or by a committee at any point in time if there's any ideas you want us to raise at the Assembly. But uh, rest assured, this is a, an issue that unites us as parties and something we work collectively uh, to deal with every day. Thanks, Daniel. Robbie Butler, MLA. Hi, Chair. Okay, it's me in the spotlight. Thanks, guys. Um, absolutely brilliant to be on with you guys here today. Some of you have known for, for quite a while now. And um, today, um, you guys are participants and not recipients, which is really important. And I think that's probably where the whole tone needs to change. So I'm not going to speak too much, okay? I'll try not to do the MLA things we normally do. I'm going to try maybe and just solicit my time and see if we can get as much of the good stuff that you guys have already done out. So I'm going to try and do this in a bit of a sandwich. So we'll do a good thing a bit of negativity, and we'll finish on the good thing again, if that's okay. So the, the good thing is this. So we will hear a lot of negativity in and around when we speak about mental health, which is, which is quite right, because there are real serious issues in Northern Ireland. And since 2016, since I started, and I know the chair has been involved with young people's groups, the number one issue that young people talk about uh, is mental health. But what I'm going to say is this, guys. Um, you guys, some of you guys have been involved in this for some time. But some of you guys have literally been birthed in your organizations through this crisis, okay? So even in the midst of a crisis, and I know the mental health champion has picked up on this, so you guys have stepped up to the plate. Now, we hear talk about walk-in counseling and counselors and can't teachers counsel and can grown ups. What I want to talk about and tease out, perhaps, is what does peer support and peer counseling look like? Because I know some of you guys have are doing that online at the moment. Um, I know some of you are writing about it. I know of some excellent work. Um, and certainly even in adult mental health services, peer support is a, is a really, really good concept. Um, so if I can just pitch that one first of all, Chair, I just want, because I know these guys have yep. a lot of 
I want to so tease out what, what peer support might look like, especially in post uh, primary education. Thanks, Sarah. Robbie, who wants to come in on that one? Morgan wants to come in to start with, and then if anyone else wants to come in on, on the importance of peer support and what good peer support can look like or looks like in your projects, um, feel free to raise your hand physically or, or via uh, the Starlink facility. Morgan? Yeah, I think peer support in post-primary schools is literally just starting that conversation when we go back going, you know, how are you, how have you been, like how have you been looking after yourself, it's literally just that kind of thing and unfortunately in a lot of schools that will be forgotten about due to mocks and exams starting, myself included, the day we go back. So there isn't time for that conversation, you know, with teachers as well to go uh, to ask your friends how they are when, you know, they might have been not even ignored, but forgotten about during the three or four months that we've been off. So I uh, just sort of starting the conversation and especially with the extracurricular um, sort of clubs and societies, whether it's, you know, sports, music, drama, whatever, you know, you do with your friends, all of that has been forgotten about <clears throat> as well due to, you know, health concerns and that's understandable but I think the more we find a way to engage with other people and the more schools find a way to engage the students with each other during the pandemic the more peer support will come out of that just naturally. Okay yeah Jay from uh, Pure Mental. So with, through Pure Mental we've set up committees that are all people led within schools across Northern Ireland and they're about getting young people from every year of the school involved and they act basically as ambassadors throughout their school for mental health. And these committees organize events. They organize, they make their own resources. They make assemblies and presentations. And it's about getting the word out, spreading awareness, and showing young people that other people care. And these committees have been really welcomed by schools, on the most part, which has been great. We've been able to set them up with the support of schools. But they're really a key way of having young people to support other young people. And it's, it's something that we're really pleased about, and hopefully that helps address some of that peer-to-peer -peer support. Sounds excellent, Jay. Anyone else want to come in on that before I bring Robbie back in? Yeah, Warren, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just want to say, Daphne, I think peer support is vital, and that's actually one of the things we incorporated into the Crisis Cafe from the very start through our uh, Friendship Cafe. You know, the Friendship Cafe draws on young people's strengths, it's you know completely youth led. It provides a safe environment and an inclusive environment for young people to socialise, talk about the impacts of mental health, talk about their own mental health and their own well being. It was something that we've included in the start, and I think it'll be vital, especially uh, upon school return. Thanks for that. Anyone else want to come in for bring Robbie back in there? Okay, Robbie. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so I said I was going to do a bit of a sandwich. So this is the this is the what I see to be probably the most important um, topic at the moment, and almost to steal the phrase, the elephant in the room. Although some of the other guys have spoken about it, and that is on the return to school. The fact that we um, it looks like uh, exams are a real thing. So they can call them assessments, they can call them whatever they want. But if you're in a highly controlled environment, and perhaps if you're sitting in them, like say you could be sitting, there's been some calculations done. By SSU and I know of, of some students having the 60 or 40 assessments or more. Um, I've seen some schools put uh, timetables together, which look ex just extremely like uh, high pressure exam timetables based on the the, uh, the information that CCA have produced. Um, there is quite a bit of written evidence to suggest that what actually should happen when young people go back to school is that space needs to be created um, to find out where young people are. Um, you know, uh, you, you guys have had as much learning as you're going to get up to this stage. We can't have that point where for four or five or six weeks we cram all that lost learning into an exam. Um, would you, and again, you're not recipients today, you're participants. What would you say? What would your message be from each, just one, one from each of your um, uh, representative bodies today to say this is what it should look like when we go back to school? I'm firmly of the belief. We need to almost do an individual um, pupil plan with the teachers as well. And then maybe look at what we did last year with the students last year and treat you exactly the same. Um, I'm not I'm not have any sort of divergence. All but the algorithm, the nasty algorithm, it, it's been sort of uh, demolished in some way. But I, I struggle to see how we can treat you guys any different uh, and certainly not be putting you under any more pressure because I think actually you've been disadvantaged further and there's been a, a 
harder impact through COVID uh, on this this cohort of, uh, of people. Experience. Thanks, Robbie. And yes, wants to come in, and then we'll bring other participants. Just uh, raise your hand. Thanks, Inez. Thank you very much, Robbie. That's very true. And I know myself as a student, like you hear my friends talk about it, like, oh, will we have exams when we go back? Will we be cramming when we go back? And even thinking about that makes you feel very anxious and it can have an impact on your mental health. But when I was talking to Louise and Grania, the co-directors of the Crisis Cafe, they brought up that, you know, we've been through such trauma during this lockdown and trauma really is what it is to be locked down in your house, not able to see friends and family. But when young people go back into a routine of school, that's when they'll be able to open up about it and that's when they need the mental health support. They don't need the opposite of being told they need to cram for exams and these are the grades they need to get because I think in some cases that's what some schools are going to do. I've heard of some schools having mocks the first week back, which even gives me butterflies in my tummy and I'm not doing them. Um, I think what we need to do when we go back is focus on children's mental health and young people's mental health because we've been through so much and I think SIA and politicians are trying to find an equivalent of the normal exam year of what we can do. But like I said in my talk, like it's not, we don't need to find another equivalent or because it's not a normal year, we need to find a different equivalent and something that takes into account the impact on our well-being and our mental health that we've had. Thank you. Theo? Brilliant. Theo. Um, kind of at Pure Mental, what we think is the best option and the best kind of strategy going forward is a staggered approach to returning to school. Um, pupils have been out of school for quite a long time and this idea that it can just go back and be, you know, all is normal with exams and assessments is going to just do poorly on, on behalf of student mental health. Um, schools need to go back and take a look about reincorporating student mental health before diving into exams and diving into assessments. As we said earlier in the presentation, we think well-being has to be number one and education and exams number two. Um, there also needs to be that continued online support with online learning. Um, SEN students, disabled students, other students, some like the accessibility that online learning provides and there still needs to be that option for students. Um, as some have grown very, very accustomed to it. I know I have grown very accustomed to learning on Teams and Zoom. Um, so there still needs to be that option. And as well as that, I think an important thing to point out in relation to exams is in 2020, uh, students who were getting their final grades, I know there was a lot of back and forth about it, eventually got their grades based on past performance. This year, it's completely different. Instead, these assessments that students don't know what the weighting of it are, they're being used to assess their final grades, even though there's evidence that they have from past years that can provide a better and clearer picture for teachers. Um, so it's quite interesting to see the department is prioritizing new assessments that are in a completely different form for these students, online assessments that they maybe struggle to do or maybe struggle to do compared to in-person exams. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Theo. Uh, I think Cormac wants to come in there as well. Thank you. I, I can't quite find the raise hand function on Starleaf, so I'm just waving at you. We'll, but, go, we'll, uh, go, we'll go old school. We'll go old school. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as for what needs to be done is that this definition of evidence that SIA have defined needs to be overhauled. And the guidance that was issued to schools on Friday needs to be immediately rescinded. I need, and they need to send out something realistic and something that isn't going to break our students when they try and come back to school. I mean, I've heard from so many students here today and through our social media channels that what their schools are planning to do is on, upon return on the 22nd, begin a suite of exams. And obviously, I totally agree. Wellbeing should come first when we come back. And, you know, other schools we're hearing will be doing the same thing with exams after the break. And so, again, what, what they're then allowing for is that week before the Easter break of sort of catch up. And it's all learning focused and it's all in classes trying to recap on what's been done in the last eight weeks online. But from sort of we come from an SSU and I and what we've proposed is that teachers be allowed to use their professional judgment. And it's totally a repeat of 2020 all over again, except this year, instead of an algorithm, it's CCEA and, and unworkable guidance. I mean, the, the requirements that they set out for what makes, what makes good evidence are shocking. CCEA will actually claim that the use of past papers aren't good evidence. If you speak to any teacher in 
Northern Ireland, that's probably what they use to assess their exam year students, pass paper questions because they're there, the resources are there for them to use. So, and with teachers having the one set of SEA support materials that the minister announced, it almost feels like SEA are trying to force teachers into having these these sets of exams. And if teachers follow the guidance by, by the letter, then that's exactly what many students will have to do. They'll be blitzed into these quick, this quick fire class test to try and okay. So what, where we okay. come from is, you know, just expand the definition of evidence, put trust back in teachers and let students know what's deciding their grades instead of using exams from October that they didn't know would be using for their grades. Thanks for that. Need you to be fairly brief in the final comment question, Robbie. Thanks. No problem, Chair. Um, uh, so I said I would do a little bit of a sandwich to the good and the bad, and it'll probably be the ugly at the end here. Um, this was my face on the, on the screen here. So with regard to, and thanks for that, guys, really useful. Um, let's just wind the clock forward a little bit, um, not just the return at exams, but perhaps even um, when our, our assessments or whatever they are. Let's wind the clock forward a little bit and say there's a normal return uh, possibly in September and everything, COVID's a, a distant memory. What are the priorities? So uh, if we look at what needs to happen next, um, once we get through this, and we will get through this next week, piece, there will be things that we will do as a committee, uh, and the Minister, I'm sure, will take it on board, um, hopefully. What do we do, actually? How do we prioritise the next step once we get through this current crisis, guys? Yeah, Matthew, go ahead. Um, thank you for the, the question, Robbie. I think something that we mentioned previously is the fact of the mental health framework, which is obviously was brought out, I think, last week, maybe the week before. We, we've had a look at the framework, and we've had a look at the strategy, and it seems very much that there is an absence of detail there. Um, everything mentioned in it is brilliant. I think it's, it's, it would solve a lot of the problems going forward. However, there's no direction whatsoever on who will be providing it, um, how long will it take, no timeline, no like because it says five million pounds in the first year, and then one point five million additionally every year after that. But there are things being proposed there, like the example of a pilot in counselling um, for primary school students, and there we have a lot of concerns regarding that because if, for example, the pilot is cancelled after a year, the kids that are receiving counselling during that year will they provide be provided with support outside of that or after it finishes? And we've reached out to. Um, Minister Weir, I think this week, and he replied basically saying he doesn't know, he doesn't know any of the how the counselling will be done or any of sort of the um, outline of the of the framework itself, and the implementation plan is equally vague there. Um, so something that we need to know first of all, I think we need to get a framework that actually is a framework rather than a list of bullet points that would be really good in practice, but there needs to be some sort of realism there that shows us how it's going to be developed, who it's going to be developed with, and how much it's going to cost. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, Jack, go ahead. Um, just you saying going into the next year, we, when we were at a group, um, as a group, we talked about maybe repeating the year, and we spoke to um, each of the members, and we were sort of split. Um, some people thought that they hadn't got enough support at home and they hadn't got learning that it should be. But like myself, I felt that I had done well and I was okay to go into the next year. So we feel that there should be a choice. So that means that people coming into P1 can move up into the year, but people who want to stay behind and repeat the year, that's done for them. But we also think that counselling needs to be more going into the new year. It needs to be daily so people can just go in and talk to the counsellor and it also needs to be individual counselling where it's not just a group to help with mindfulness or whatever it needs to be individual to, um, so they can think about individual problems thanks for that folks okay Robert. yep thank you chair thank you everybody for your input today really 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 good Thanks for that, Robbie. Thanks, uh, witnesses as well. Can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA? Uh, thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks to yeah, everyone for the powerful presentations this morning and for all your hard work. Uh, there's a massive corpus of information there, which will be hugely important for government as we go forward. Um, I wanted to touch initially on uh, Morgan's presentation about the 
um, percentages. Um, some very stark figures there, 65% uh, of the respondents in terms of the quality of learning, uh, remotely, and 71% in terms of self-isolating students uh, that their mental health had suffered. Uh, in my constituency in North Belfast and Greater Shank, there's a clear, as I call it, the other pandemic that has been uh, certainly playing out on the ground of huge issues around mental health and uh, uh, mindfulness and uh, suicide awareness. Uh, this is a huge and growing problem, as we all know. Um, I think there are questions that this committee needs to ask, Chair, in terms of the EA and there being no guidance to schools. I know that um, certainly in the, the uh, conversations that I have through the Shine group that I sit on with the Boys Model, Girls Model, Belfast Royal Academy and Hazelwood College, um, I talk to the, the, the principals and the reps from those schools. You know, it should not be the case that money for counselling, and I'm not underplaying the importance of counselling, should be coming out of mainstream frontline school budgets. This is something where we need a joined up approach on. Uh, and uh, mention was made, uh, Ina's made a very good point uh, in terms of the quote, uh, and I hope I'm quoting it correctly. Poor mental health is a, a, an epidemic in Northern Ireland. That's entirely right. That's hugely accurate. And on that issue, um, I have put the point to the mental health champion, um, the Professor O'Neill and to the minister. We need a joined up approach around these things in terms of um, reboot, rebooting for young people, uh, in terms of return to uh, school. And I think there needs to be a joined up approach in terms of Department of Education, obviously, and, and the Education Authority, but DFC Health, Public uh, Health Authority, um, and in terms of you know uh, churches, youth organisations, sporting organisations, and uniformed organisations. Um, can I just ask what to what to our uh, representatives and guests here this morning think of that approach? Who would like to come in on that? Yeah, Morgan. Morgan, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry, I don't know why that keeps happening um, I think in your constituency North Belfast there is a lack of the the funding that is needed especially for mental health and schools in general I'm aware that there was a, a young boy in your area Daniel Black who killed himself only a few weeks ago and um, due to the lack of services and lack of you know help available that should have been there for him and in these cases we can only hope that we learn um, to get the help where it's needed. I know in schools where tragedies like that have happened already, there have been more opportunities created for um, young people to seek help, but we shouldn't need um, things like that to happen for the help to be there. It shouldn't become, you know, as a responsive. The phrase I like to use is mental health um, strategies should be more proactive than reactive. And I think that um, hammers home sort of what you were saying. Uh, Chair, I, I don't, I'm happy if others want to come in, but I think part of the problem that we have identified locally is that there can be at times an issue of a joined upness or an, a, an insufficiency in the joined upness, shall we say, uh, in terms of groups that uh, there can be their valuable work ongoing, the likes of extern and integrated services and so on, but sometimes joined upness is a problem. What would your view be on that, Morgan or other colleagues? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. I think the one good thing to come out um, of the pandemic is the sort of cooperation between the Department for Education and the Department of Health. And hopefully that will be ongoing for the, you know, for the foreseeable future with regards to mental health, because school counselling in schools is funded by education, but CAMS is funded by um, the Department of Health. So it's a, almost a lottery of you know what service is actually going to help you at this stage because there's different funding for different schools and different places. I mean, I go to you know quite a well-funded school in South Belfast, and the counselling services there are shocking. So I can only I can't even imagine 
what they'd be like in places that don't have the same funding and don't have the same even amount of councillors in the area that are accessible to go to the school. Would any others have any views around those issues? I, I think, Chair, in terms of the um, responsiveness as well, if I could touch on that, I mean, I know that as a governor in two schools, one a secondary and one a primary, um, there, there are huge issues in terms of, and some, some of our contributors this morning have touched on it, in terms of young people um, learning remotely. You know, there is the parental sort of familial support, which, you know, in many homes um, is, is excellent, but not in every home by any stretch of the imagination. Um, friend and peer support for, for, for older children. Obviously, the, the lack of technology for many homes has been a, an issue as well as this committee has uh, touched on. Um, what what um, are, are the views of of um, the, the our contributors on, around those issues in terms of the, the communication cooperation in terms of the providers around those issues? Just William, just to check up around kind of uh, family support and, and, yeah, and the, really digital important. digital digital access. Yeah. yeah. Some things yeah. have been better than others in terms of rolling out the and being able to secure the, the technology and so on for mm. in terms of remote learning. Um have the have the, the, the uh are contributors any views around those issues, Chairman? Thanks. Thanks, William. I bring in Lauren from the youth forum. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in there. Um, just on your last question there, William, um, you, I think um, North Belfast um, have done well in terms of their youth organisations and making sure that that has been a joined up approach um, over the last number of months, particularly. Um, just on this issue, I think we need to remember that parents aren't all like have every time in the world to support their young people. Do you know, they are doing their jobs um, like some some of them are frontline workers, you know, and we can't expect the world as well. Um, and I think it's about normalising the situation. We're all human at the end of the day. We can't expect the sun, the earth and the moon, you know. Um, but um, in terms of digital poverty, um, I think there could be greater um, done. And in terms of access to resources, there could be packs made, etc. Um, I can see Cormac agreeing with me there. And I know schools have been doing that. Um, but I think there has been there has to be more done, you know, in terms of even the government linking up with um, technical technical firms um, to get these resources, um, connectivity linking up. We've seen it um, happen in other areas of the UK, so why can't we push for more here? Thanks, Lauren. Jay, you want to come in as well there? Yeah, so just on the issue of distant learning, especially with primary schools, these first classes that are coming back, the primary one, two, and three, we, what we've heard from primary school principals is that it is very limited what you can do online with those years, because those years are all about key skills, relationships, um, manners, things like that. And it's really hard to convey those through an iPad screen. So we think on the return, there needs to be basically that back to basics approach. But then on the issue of uh, the technology, digital poverty, it is a reality that some families have four kids and one iPad and they're fighting over it. And that has to be taken into account when schools get back that because of this, children will be at different stages based on the technology that they have. And that needs to be considered during the, sorry, during the return. Okay, Chairman, okay. Chairman, many of the questions I had have, have been answered, so um, if you want to move on, I'm happy enough. Thank you very much, everybody, and keep up the great work. Very impressive, indeed. Thank you. Thanks for that, William. Uh, can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA? Thank you, Chair. And again, thanks to everyone for attending here this morning, this afternoon now, um, to the committee meeting. It's really important. It's been really good to hear from me, and it's so important that your voices are heard. Um, I think it's so important overall that children and young people get a say in the decision making um, and in moves going forward. Uh, the Chair has already alluded to that, and I definitely back it up. So um, keep being heard. Um, and somebody else had also mentioned about you know, getting in touch with us um, either as a committee or as individual members with any issues you have because that's what our job is is to um 
bring forward your message, so please do that. Um, your evidence here this morning has been stark, and although many of us feel that we know what children and young people are going through, to hear it in this matter really, in this manner, sorry, really brings it home to us. So thanks for doing that there. Um, you know, young people have really paid a huge price throughout the pandemic, and we certainly acknowledge that there. Um, we know that you've sacrificed a lot, and we again we thank you for that there. Um, and now it's about you know helping you get out the other side of it. That's what we are here for. Um, I agree with a number of comments that were made throughout the morning that the delay in decision making by the Education Minister and the Department of Education and their poor communication of the decisions made has caused um, massive problems for everybody involved. Um, it's created more confusion and it's, it's, it's been a real frustration, so we definitely agree with you there. Um, we have, as, as committee members, have continually called for plans to be aired um, swiftly, clearly, and communicated clearly, so we're with you there with backing, backing you up on that one. Um, one question I would like to ask, start off with asking, is about the return to school. Inez, you had mentioned about your fear um, after the first lockdown. And return to school in September by bringing um, the, the virus home to your grandmother and to your family in general. Do you as a group and still have those fears or um, with the vaccination rollout and that, are you a bit more confident going back to school for that reason? Um, also, you, like other people have mentioned, just general anxieties and stress about going back because they've been at home so long and it's now almost strange to go back into that classroom environment um, with the noise and the distractions and all that there. So how are you feeling about going back um, this time around? Thanks, Nicola. Really important questions there. Bring in uh, Rona from the Children's Commissioner Youth Panel. I think there's still a lot of fear regarding the going back to school uh, I know that I'm still quite afraid of going back to school and maybe bringing it home to members of my family who could be vulnerable or even accidentally spreading it to my friends families who may be vulnerable and I think especially as um, I know when we went back to school uh, in September uh, my school at least tried very hard to keep up with uh, social distancing, uh, routes in the corridors, you could only go down one way, hand sanitizer, wipes, uh, mask in the hallways. But as the weeks went on, that slo people started slowly not caring that much about it. And you'd go into a class, there'd be no hand sanitizer, no wipes. And I'm just worried the exact same thing will happen again. And it will be really difficult to take your own precautions and be safe on your own while in the school environment. Thanks for that, Bruna. Really important issue this. Anyone else want to come in? Bring Morgan in, yeah. And anyone else that wants to come in, bring Jay in after that as well. I think it's important we hear from young people on this one, absolutely. Morgan? I think um, this going back is definitely, um, young people are looking forward to it. I mean, especially with the vaccine rollout, there are a lot less concerns um, about people bringing the, the virus back to their family members and, you know, the people around them. The one thing I'd be worried about is still the exam stress. I think the best way I can put this is with my own, you know, my own situation. What's happening for me is that I have a two-hour English paper on the day after we go back and I haven't had an English class since the start of December. And, you know, in what normal society could come and sit an exam, not having done a class for three months. So I think the, people, the teachers need to take a step back and facilitate the well-being of the students before doing the exams. I know we've talked a lot about that today, but just to sort of reiterate. Thanks for that, Morgan. And uh, Jay, you want to come in as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, through our consultation with young people and what we've heard over and over again through the committees and the Youth Council primarily, is that that fear of it going back, the physical side of it, is one of the only, if not the only, reservation that young people are having about returning. That young people want to get back to school, they want to see their friends, but they are afraid of bringing it home. They've had people saying that it's not safe, that they don't think their school can distance safely. 
And one quote that I think stood out to us when we were asking people like this is a, a week or so ago, they were saying, I would go back to school tomorrow if it was safe, but it isn't. So there is this one thing to go back, but that's being uh, balanced with the fear of being unsafe. And then finally, I'd just like to say that there does seem to be, as we said in our presentation, a conflicting message between the stay at home, stay distant, this message saying that meeting with people is a threat to everybody's physical health, yet saying that going back to school in a classroom of 30 people is safe enough. Thanks, Jay. Anyone else want to come in? I, I suppose to, to supplement that as well, Nicola, is, is, is to ask how young people feel they've been communicated to in relation to the safety of of school restart uh, and or what mitigations are in place to ensure that it is safe for you, Oren? Yeah, just on school restart, I think, um, I know I'm much more comfortable about the school. Last March, I was identified. Oren, sorry, sorry, to, sorry to pause you for a second. Can I just remind everybody to go on mute when you're not speaking, just to make sure we can hear each other as clearly as possible. Thanks, Oren. Uh, I was just uh, saying that uh, I know I myself am much more confident with the return to school in terms of safety regarding coronavirus. Last March, I was identified as being clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, I took the choice to still go to school because I thought it was the only way I would properly be able to learn. Um, I have now received my first dose of the coronavirus vaccine, which has kind of looked at things and it hopes that it will be much safer when returning to school. But I think it is important when returning to school to focus on that mental health aspect as well, that it can't be just the same. You know, we're coming out of this remote learning with a lot, and a lot of tensions among young people are high, they're really stressed and things are really different. Okay. Nicola, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, thanks um, very much for all that, for that from everybody. Um, this is why we rely on planning from the Minister and to have mitigations in place so that you can go back confidently, you don't have to be nervous about it. I fully agree that um, mental health should be first. Morgan, I think it was you that said that on the day after you go back, you were sitting on an English paper. That, that's too much stress. I, I can't believe they're actually expecting you to do that there. Um, I'm sure they have reasons, but you know, definitely I agree that your mental health and well-being should be at the fore on the return to school. There will be time to do exams or to do to get back to the education academic side of it, you know. Um, but that's really interesting to hear from you all. Thank you for that. The other point I wanted to discuss, um, because it was International Women's Day this week, and because I'm the only female on the Education Committee, I think it was an onus on me to um, to bring up the like kind of gender equality. Um, I want to ask, in, in the consideration of the effect of the pandemic on children and young people and their mental health and that, has you, did you identify anything gender specific, any gender specific issues? I think uh, the chair has dropped out again. Sorry, I'm back. I'm back. I think I'm back in again. Now, uh, Sophia, Sophia, you want to come in on that one? Thanks. Thanks for that question. I know, speaking from my own perspective, um, like women are a lot more open about talking about their own mental health issues. Like I know for a fact that within my own school, there's been a number of people who have unfortunately tried to attempt, and most of them have been girls. But I guarantee that number is far higher because boys aren't as open about talking about their mental health issues. And that's across the board. It's not just with young people. Um, I think personally, there needs to be like a, remo like a removal of the stigma around mental health and issues that people would have. Like I'm very open about the fact that I've gone to counselling and it shouldn't be a thing that people are ashamed of. And I think a lot of young people are experiencing that in the pandemic, that they're made the same like on social media they come across as if they're having a care in the world and that they're strong and they're fine, whereas at home they might be crumbling to pieces. And I think that's where the digital age is really affecting people and like online learning. Teachers aren't asking children how they're doing. They're not seeing them into the day-to-day -day environment. Whereas if someone just goes, are you all right? Are you okay? What's going on? Like there's a big thing behind that. Thanks, Sophia. Anyone else want to come in on that? It's a really important question from Nicola. Okay, that, thank, thanks for that. Nicola, you want to come, come back in? Yes, um, 
Sophia, thank you for that there. And this is why it is so important to hear from young people because I feel like you are a lot braver um, than maybe generations before that you are willing to talk about these things to make sure that mental health isn't still, it doesn't continue to be a taboo subject. Um, and it's so important that we do discuss this in a public forum so people know it's okay to reach out and ask for help. Um, so yeah, again, I appreciate you um, contributing with that there and now. There now. Um, one other question I wanted to ask, and it's slightly off topic, but it's about, again, um, about females, um, and it's about um, period poverty. Um, do you think this is, is a significant um, source of stress for um, young girls at school um, now at the minute? Thanks for that, Nicola. Can I bring Bruna in on that, and then Sophia? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I have been involved in some of the period poverty stuff uh, with my mum's work, but um, I think that still to this day, a lot of young girls are embarrassed of getting their period and they do especially be embarrassed if they don't, they can't afford the products that they need for it. So yeah, I definitely do think that for some young people, uh, it is like a major stressor in their life that contributes to their mental health. Thanks, Bruna. Can I bring in Sophia and then Tacey? Hi. Um, so whenever we look at the period poverty campaign, I know particularly within my own school, um, we have a red box. So in the girls' bathroom, there'll be sanitary products that are free and available, and the PE teachers will provide that for free. They pay out of their own pocket to be able to provide that for us students. I think having teachers having to pay for student sanitary products to make them feel comfortable in a school environment says a lot about what's going on and says a lot about how women in particular and anybody who experiences a period like feels pressured into not being able to go to school because they aren't able to afford products. Well said. Can I bring in uh, Tacey as well then? Thanks. Hi. So... I think that in our school you have to go to the nurse if you don't have any pads or whatever you need. So that is a really hard thing for especially first to third years who have just got it and are unaware and still figuring it out for themselves. And it's a really hard process to have to talk to an older person about something so personal. And there is still a lot of stigma even if it is a female nurse or a woman you're talking to. Um, I think having period products available in... Uh, toilets and secondary schools is vital. It saves a lot of embarrassment or just uncomfort for kids as well as most schools now are traditional and girls have to wear skirts. And being on, in a skirt on your period is a very stressful experience. And most schools don't offer women the chance to wear trousers. And I find this myself. I wear trousers in school, but I have to do a lot of work to get there. And it's only for me because my school was unwilling to see the necessity for women to wear trousers. It's not just a period thing, it's a personal thing. But if you're looking at it from a period perspective, you're a lot more comfortable and secure when you're in trousers and you don't feel as vulnerable, I think. And so as well as period poverty, there's a greater need to look at different things associated with periods. And yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for that. N Nicola? Yeah, thank you so much. That is right to the three of you. Um, again, just like the mental health, I think it's a really important thing to keep talking about so it's not a taboo subject. So thanks to the three of you for, for that there. Um, I know there's been a lot of work has um, taken place recently about uh, to address period poverty, but there's still a lot of work to do as well. Um, but that was really interesting to hear from you. From me, so thank you and thank you to you. Thanks for raising that, Nicola. You, as you say, the, the committee has has uh, met with Homeless Period Belfast in, in relation to period poverty, and I, I was privileged to present a petition uh, on the floor of the Assembly in relation to this. So I, I think it's fair to say the Education Committee is fully behind the, the campaign to make sure uh, period products are freely available in all schools. Um, and I think you raise another important issue that's been raised with me recently as well in terms of um, the, the, the permission to wear trousers, um, period products and the, the permission to wear trousers should just be available in schools, full stop. It's quite shocking that, it, that we're not there yet. Um, so thank you, Nicola, for raising that and 
and thank you to all the uh, young women that have spoke there in relation to those issues. Um, thank you. Okay, can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA? Thanks, Chair. Um, Cormac Morgan, Sophia, Inez, Oren, Matthew, Theo, Jay, Lauren, Jack, Brona, and Tazy. Um, considering the content of your presentation today, which was frightening, it was troubling, challenging, worrying, scary, unsettling, given that your delivery was inspirational, it was articulate, it was assured, it was authentic, it was impassioned, it was world class. There are so many people who live vicariously through you. Friends, um, family, classmates. And when you do something good, it makes them feel good. When you do something strong, it makes them feel strong. When you do something powerful, it makes them feel powerful. Don't underestimate the impact you guys are having on the people you know today by the way you've delivered. Your parents will be so proud. Your families will be so proud. Your communities will be so proud. Your teachers will be so proud. Your classmates will be so proud. And your organisations will be so proud. But the people who should be most proud are yourselves. Are yourselves. Be very, very proud. Take a well-earned vow. You know, the rapport from your, of your presentation, the energy, the enthusiasm, the destigmatizing nature of it, the power of your communication, was staggeringly positive. Take a well-earned vow, each and every one of you. Well done. The Crisis Cafe talks about is hashtag empowering young people. You guys are not empowering young people. You're empowering the world. It was incredibly powerful what you've done. Well done to each and every one of you. Now, you've all been very challenging to us as elected representatives, and that's uh, credit to you for that. And I think our, our society has a bright future with you guys from behind us. I'm um, looking behind me, knowing that you guys are on my tracks, and, uh, and that makes me feel good. That makes me feel brilliant, knowing that there's that quality of people, that quality of person coming behind us, which is very, very strong. Now, you've challenged us. I'm going to challenge you. There are those who are, who are inspired by what you've done today, as I've said. There are those who are sitting at home watching this online, and they're thinking, Oh, Jesus, I could never do that. You've overcome your fears. You've, you've been brave. You've overcome your inhibitions. You're, you've overcome your shyness. And you're, you're the people who are comfortable speaking at the top of the class. There are those sitting at home thinking, oh, I could never do that. Like, I, Jesus, look, there's in his presenting like that. I could never do that. I want you to reach out to those people today. One, pick one person each, each and every one. You reach out to one, that person you know who's sitting at home who's thinking they're inadequate. They're not access. this. Reach out to that person and say, I did that today for you. I did this today for you. This is for you. You can do this too. You can come behind me and I'll help you. I'll support you to do that. So that's a challenge for each and every one of you. What is your perspective, guys? And it's something that I'm worried about for myself personally. What's your perspective on screen time? Screen time, which has obviously spiked throughout this pandemic, and I'm spending too much mm -hmm. of my life sitting in front of the screen. I'm really, my, eye, my eyesight has deteriorated throughout this pandemic. I feel my physical well-being has deteriorated. What's your perspective as young people on screen time? Good question, Justin. I've got Brona uh, to come in with a raised hand, and then Matthew and Sophia. Brona? I think maintaining screen time at like a low level has been so difficult during the pandemic because whereas if I was going out before the pandemic with friends, I wouldn't be on my phone at all the entire time. Whereas now I have nothing else to do. It's the only way I can contact my friends. I have to be on my phone for all my online classes. And then but I have to complete my work online on a computer and hand it in online. And it's really, really emotionally draining just to be on your phone or your iPad or your computer all day and knowing that you can't do anything about it because you have to use it and it's uh, I know many people get migraines from being on it for so long my eyes are constantly sore from looking at a screen but I just think it's really difficult to lower your screen time um, since you need it so much during uh, online school. Thanks for that. I think we had uh, Matthew and then Sophia. 
thank you. Um, I'd, I'd always like to echo what was said there. Um, I think research conducted by Emily McGlinchey um, at Queen's, among other people, um, find that they were basically studying media use during lockdown um, and COVID, not specifically social media, um, but, you know, Netflix and those sorts of things. And then they found there was a significant correlation between um, higher media consumption and higher levels of anxiety and depression amongst um, specifically young people, um, which I think is obviously a huge issue. But if we look at the likes of social media, um, if you look at the likes of I know a couple of years ago, there was a huge increase in self-harm because self-harm was being promoted on Instagram, for example. And I think those sorts of issues are also something that perhaps isn't talked about enough, um, that there's no safeguarding in terms of what people can see on social media. And I know from my own experience of being in first year of uni, um, there's nothing really outside of school to do. It's just you do your work and then there's no incentive for you to do the work because there's nothing outside of the work. Um, but certainly I know it has been a, a big issue in terms of, I mean, the majority of, of students probably work in their bedroom at a desk and that's meant to be the place where you sleep and relax, but it's also mm -hmm. become the place where you do so much work. And I think it, finding a real difficulty there of, of relaxation in my own case, working on pure mental a, a lot of the time um really i have school work and then pure mental and then there isn't really that opportunity for me to relax because i have i'm i've been shielding i've only seen my friends uh, once or twice since july and it really has been a struggle for me in that regard i think perhaps um social media is, is all well and good but it, there's nothing that you can compare to face to face thanks matthew i bring in sophia and then in yes so I know I'm in a very privileged position where in my school they provided iPads for the entire sixth form for us to use, which was incredible. Um, but I do feel like my life is completely dictated by the iPad because there'll be notifications going off maybe 11, 12 at night with teachers posting work for tomorrow. And because it is in a case that you need to go into school to complete the work, you can just open the iPad that's sitting beside your bed and get it done then and there. And sometimes you're sitting to maybe 2, 3 in the morning going, actually, I should be asleep. But it's so easy to just do that work and students don't have a creative outlet anymore where they can't go see their friends. They can't go and socialise outside of their home. Instead, it's go for a walk or maybe go to the shop. Like work is actually a outlet for them. And I know that I've been pouring a lot of my like passion into our student union because I have nowhere else to put it unless I'm sitting doing work and I'll be working. Like, I could work 24 hours a day if I could because... There's no way, there's no limit of a teacher going, right, okay, stop for today. Or maybe don't do this. There's nothing to stop a student from working continuous hours and getting locked on fatigue and eyesight like deteriorating because of the amount of time they're spending on an iPad or on a computer or whatever they're using. Okay. Uh, Inez and then uh, Lauren, really briefly, and then I'll get you back in, Justin. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. I think your your dedication is you've you've stayed with us even when you're walking at the same time. So we <laughs> we appreciate it. No, thank you. Um, thanks. Go ahead. Sorry, um, thanks. But it's very similar to what Sophia said. It's just that there's never an off time. Like at least when you're in school, you know that at twenty past three, okay, you might have to go home and do a bit of homework and study. But at least you know that the school works over for the day, and there's only a finite amount of things that you need to do. But with the lockdown, it just it doesn't stop for young people. They always feel like there's something more to do, especially with the uncertainty around exams. Like, we don't know if it's going to be our A21 or A22, in my case, of an A-level student. And you just don't know which notes to make, what homework to do, and you just you just kind of throw yourself at everything. Um, and as well as that, the social aspect as well. You're spending all your school time at the screen, but for the social side, you have to be at a screen as well. And it's kind of worse for your mental health because once you come off that Zoom and once you hit that leave button, you just miss it even more and you miss your friends because you know that's not the way it's supposed to be you know that you're supposed to be with them and you're supposed to be talking to them but it just makes you feel even more empty and even more I don't know upset by the pandemic and I think that's great my screen time personally has gone through the roof and I know my friends have as well so I hope that answers your question thank you yeah, th th thanks for that we're, we're glad that you're on the screen uh, with us today but I feel like I should be getting us off these screens <laughs> after, after that question now but I get Lauren and then I'll come back to you Justin thank you 
Yeah, um, we're seeing young people are busier than ever because they're committing themselves to so many things. As Sophia said, young people are picking up as many things as possible to keep themselves busy. They're doing work to all hours at night. My bed's right beside behind me here. Do you know, we're living in one room, basically. My mum's downstairs working right now. Do you know, my dad's furloughed, so he's downstairs in the kitchen. And that, like, there's nowhere else for me to go. And facilities are closed, all these other resources. And then in terms of young people who engage with youth organisations or volunteer, they're having to do that online. Do you know, there's no other outlet. Like, for me personally, I've started volunteering in my community on outreach because it gets me out of the house, away from the screen. And that's my dedicated time of the week that I'm away from it. Thanks, Justin. Um, I think, I think uh, well, thanks for those answers. Um, the, the concept of the crisis cafe, the concept of pure metal, I think they're ingenious, absolutely ingenious. I think they can be really powerful forces for goods, not just on a local level, on a global scale. And I think the, the, the potential there is enormous. And so well done to you folks for, for creating those. And obviously for all the groups that are represented here today, which who have all spoke very, spoken very powerfully. In terms of the... Um, Actually, you know, guys, that the education minister was supposed to be here today and we're now eating into the time that he was supposed to be occupying. But for me, this is better. This is better. I'm glad the minister's not, not here. This is more important because we're getting, we're getting information from the coal face and people who really understand what is happening, what's happening on the ground. So this is so much more important. Um, it was mentioned around mental health strategies should be proactive as opposed to reactive. Morgan said that. I fully agree. Um, I want to ask you all, how are you being careful not to compartmentalize mental health? Understanding that the, the, human, the human system is all interlinked, it's all interconnected. Our, our mental health is connected to our physical health, it's connected to our emotional health, it's connected to our, to our spiritual well-being. How, how are you being careful not to compartmentalize mental health? Okay, Inez was in with the hand raised there immediately, so I better bring her back in. Uh, if anybody else wants to come in, just to track my attention as well. Morgan, sorry, I think I missed you a couple of times previously. Apologies. We'll get you back in after Inez. Thanks. Hi, um, thank you very much. That's a very good point. I think sometimes you can focus too much. Well, not too much, but you can compartmentalize it into something that is just mental, and we know that other aspects in, um, impact it. And at the Crisis Cafe, we've been trying to address those things. Um, we also we hold exercise classes with a local young person who runs a kind of fitness blog and a fitness page. And she's been very kind to lend her time. And that's helped our young people because it helps them get active and it helps them see other young people. Although I'm sure a lot of the cameras are odd when they're actually working out. Um, we've also worked with a sleep expert who has helped our young people to in, improve their sleep and as well as that a dietitian. Um, and through our self-care calendar that I mentioned before, we've touched on many other aspects that can impact people's mental health, um, such as discrimination can impact people's mental health. So we touched on that and how to be an ally to um, minority communities. And um, we also just touched on um, body image. And this week, myself and my friend are actually doing one on eating and relationships with food, because we know that that can impact on your mental health as well. Um, this is just what we're doing as a cafe, but I know that the other organisations are working on other things as well. But it's just, it kind of hits home that, like you said, it is very important that we don't just compartmentalise mental health because there's so many other things that lead into it. Um, our body image, our relationships with food, our relationships with our friends and family, um, our relationships with our community even, especially in Northern Ireland, where a society in the needs to work every day to work more across community. Um, and I think that it's just important that we consider those other aspects, but I think that we as organisations are trying to do that. Thank you very much. I hope that answers the question. That's an exceptional response, and yes, thank you. Um, I'll bring Morgan in as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the only sort of to reiterate uh, Inez's point, just to stop, to stop the compartmentalising of mental health. I mean, the closest thing that I can think of uh, to some of the examples that she provided would be when you were learning about the eat well plate in home economics in junior school and the balanced diet and that's it nothing even about exam stress or how to deal with that how to deal with if you are you know feeling down or anything like that so I think it really needs to be up to the schools and up to the um, department to be able to hammer home um, you know it's okay not to be okay ultimately and how to deal with that and how to deal with how to help, uh, how to get the help that you need. Thanks, Morgan. Anyone else want to come in before I go back to Justin? Okay. Justin? 
Um, you mentioned that the issue around 30 people on Zoom and how that impacts education and how that impacts the, the teacher's ability to reach out to kids one-on-one -on -one and, and young people one-on-one. -on -one. How concerned are you that uh, through that lack of connectivity from being in the classroom, teachers are not able to identify those children who are possibly coming from troubled homes, those young people who are possibly coming from troubled homes, who can see there's a problem, who can see there's an issue, whereas on Zoom, you cannot see that. So I would like your feedback in terms of anecdotally or otherwise, how, how do you feel that is impacting young people right now? That kids don't have that outlet from their school, from their teacher, that protection. What, what, what are your concerns? What are your thoughts around that issue? And uh, Cormac, then on that, and then Morgan. I mean, um, definitely there has been an impact on how able teachers are to perform sort of their role as like in safeguarding and child protection. And I mean, it, and you know, that sort of, um, Justin, I would say, doubles over into mental health as well. And teachers not seeing you, you know, I know in my online classes, we have our cameras off and most of the time our mics are muted um, because of, you know, as the committee knows, you know, hearing noise um when someone's speaking so what we so you know that teachers aren't able to perform that same job because there isn't the same level of interaction with students the best way i could probably say it would be that a lot of our online classes at the minute feel a lot like lectures um because it is hard to have the similar kind of engagement online it's through no fault of our teachers it's just um you know the limitations of using the technology but i, I mean and i would sort of as well, link that the teachers will have a really difficult time spotting a student who's struggling with their mental health at the minute. Um, and we've recommended in the mental health report that teachers get, are given annual training for spotting the signs of mental health in the way they are with safeguarding, given that safeguarding impacts one in 10 and mental health one in four of our young people, that, that, that teachers should be given mental health um, uh, sort of first aid training at least once a year, in addition to having that added to their PGCE and B Ed qualifications as well. But um, I mean, definitely there's been a giant impact on how well teachers can perform that safeguarding role through no fault of their own, but just the limitations of the virtual classroom. Morgan, yep. And then I'll bring you back in, Justin, yep. Yeah, sorry, I'll be brief, but I feel like me and Cormac are literally on the same uh, brain wave here. I was literally thinking the exact same thing. I mean, the online classes at the minute do you feel like lectures and some people don't even you know i only have two a week and i'm sure loads of other people have them have that same situation so there's very little opportunity for teachers to engage with students in that way and they and you know go are you okay like if there's serious signs that they are struggling with their mental health there's no opportunities and um, to sort of consult them about that and i would argue that in schools you know in a normal year um that there is you know, teachers are unaware of how to deal with the issues. You know, if um, someone has a panic attack in their class, you know, do they know how to respond with that? You know, do they know how to point them in the right direction for help? I know um, the pastoral care teams obviously uh, have their own roles in school, but I know in most schools, part of the pastoral care team is your head of year. And, you know, if it's a big, you know, six foot rugby coach, obviously you'd be less inclined to go and ask for help, especially since... You know, that's how you have to, in most schools, that's how you have to access the counselling services by going through uh, a member of the pastoral care team. Okay. You're talking to a six foot Gaelic player here, Morgan. You need to go easy. <laughs> on that, Justin. On that, uh, sure. <laughs> what, what's your perspective in terms of uh, sport? And when I say sport, I don't just mean uh, playing Gaelic football, or playing soccer, or playing hockey. What about physical activity and the lack of access to physical activity as a consequence of lockdown for children and young people? How concerned, how, sorry, not, how debilitating is that for, for young people? How um, is that holding you back physically, emotionally and mentally because of obviously the interlinkedness, interlinkedness of the human system? What are your thoughts in terms of how that has been totally stopped and the impact of that? Lauren, you want to come in on that one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so previously I discussed um, about the link of mental and physical health to each other. And I think that's vital. Um, if I just pull out some statistics from our survey, um, in terms of young people thinking gyms should be closed, 
um, 50% said they shouldn't be during the lockdown. In terms of sports need to stop, 63% disagreed and felt that should continue during a lockdown. Do you know, young people are engaging with people when they're doing exercise. The endorphins you get when you do exercise, do you know, it's that feel-good energy. And that's, I think, the key thing we're lacking right now. I know it's great to say, oh, we'll do something outside. You can do uh, yoga in your room, do you know, but that's still a controlled environment, I think. The lack of green spaces in some areas also impacts on young people's access to this. And it's about kind of bringing that energized um, way of life back, you know, and just gaining all that like kind of excitement back from doing sport because it does make us feel better and good. And then it brings positive impacts. Absolutely. Um, Inez, can you tell me, one, some, give me some information in terms of Crisis Cafe, what you were doing before the pandemic hit and what you were doing during and what you intend to do afterwards? Uh, hi, um, thank you very much for that question, Justin. Um, I think I kind of mentioned it with Robin before. What we were doing before the pandemic and before the lockdown when public health um, um, restrictions eased, we did friendship cafes. So every Thursday, young people could come in and it was a friendly and social environment, obviously COVID safe as well that just allowed young people to forget about exams and to forget about the uncertainty and to forget about everything else. The fact that, you know, there's a pandemic around them, it just allowed them to be young people again, which is what we've kind of forgotten about over the year. Um, and we also had a drop in service on a Sunday, which was similar um, enough to the Friendship Cafe, but there was less people. So it allowed people to kind of ease into the social environment. And then once they felt comfortable, maybe after a week, maybe two weeks, they could ask for the one to one um clinical counselling in a non-clinical setting which has been really beneficial to anyone that I've talked to um, it's obviously it's anonymous but if anyone who's come forward and has talked about it has said that it's really helped them because sometimes they're afraid to go to their GP um, like we're all here today because we're outspoken young people but some young people are afraid to speak out and um, so that was a very valuable service and like all the uh, other organisations we've had to pivot to um, an online model um, but we have been able to do that. We've been offering friendship supports through um, ambassador cafes. Ambassadors are people who represent our cafe. Um, they might use it themselves, but they try to promote it to their friends as well. Um, and we've also hosted social events like a quiz. But what's really helped us during lockdown is empowering young people through our self-care calendar. Um, like I said, it's activities, reflections, thoughts on different topics every week. We've done body image, anxiety, isolation and loneliness, identity and expression, self-empowerment and all the things that really matter to young people and that can help them improve their mental health. We've also hosted talks, like I said, we did with a sleep expert, um, a dietitian as well, and we host um, exercise events as well. We're just looking at how we can empower young people and those um, self-care calendar ideas, they don't come from, not they used to come from us, but now they come from the young people because we are a youth-led organisation. Um, and that's what we've done during lockdown. But moving forward, we want to work with schools to deliver training to staff and students which is something that Cormac and Morgan touched on and um, we want to within schools be a student-led organization so within some schools we would look at setting up sanctuaries so like crisis cafes almost within the school and these would be student-led by the ambassadors as we have ambassadors in every school in the Nuri area and um, I know you're the Nuri and Arma MLA yourself so you'll appreciate that but we have those connections to the school and we just need to work on bringing that into a physical place within the school. Um, it pays it forward and it creates that link between the crisis cafe and the school. If the school can't afford or doesn't have the resources to provide counselling services themselves five days a week, we can do that as crisis cafe. We can offer that support to the schools. Um, and it's just working alongside schools and empowering schools and students to get the best mental health supports they can need because that's what students deserve. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, and yes, I'm going to need to bring you to a close, Justin. Thanks. Yeah. Well, just to say thank you very much, and it's uh, inspiring what you're doing, the work you're doing is really inspiring, um, and inspiring your delivery today. Finally, guys, um, I'm going to try and live up to the challenge you've set for me as a politician, that is to do better. I will do my best. I want to say thank you all for your presentations. It's very, very important. And I want you to keep empowering young people. I want you to keep empowering the world. Well done, folks. Thanks, Justin. Can I bring in uh, Morris Bradley, MLA, to finish our session? Thanks, Morris. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, it's been a very worthwhile session this morning, I can assure you. And I'd like to thank all our presenters this morning. Their enthusiasm and knowledge has, has really shown through, and I find it both informative and uplifting uh, to hear a united voice, a united voice highlighting 
the real problems that are facing our children and young people today uh, in this pandemic, pandemic and coming out of this pan- pandemic. I would pick up on a, a point that, that Justin raised in that screen time. Before I was an MLA, I worked in a newspaper office, and sometimes I would spend 12, 13 hours a day in front of a screen. Uh, the main problems there was going home mentally awake and physically tired. It took a couple of hours to bring your body back into line with each other uh, and mentally and physically. And I, I felt that that left the tired, le- felt that that led to a lot of tiredness the following day and sometimes the day after. So there's a danger and too much screen time. Sitting in front of a computer, I also had to wear glasses to drive. And funny, six months after leaving the newspaper industry, my eyesight went back to perfect. So I don't need to wear glasses anymore. So there are hidden dangers there uh, that we need to be aware, aware of. And also sitting in front of a computer, you tend to lose uh, all sense of reality and you miss your meal times. You miss your organized meal times. I know sometimes I didn't get anything to eat from 10 o'clock in the morning to maybe 10 o'clock at night. So you do miss that. Uh, and computers are a dangerous thing to sit in front of too long. But anyway, Rowan mentioned a point uh, that I had raised previously in this committee, and that for schools to open up their buildings and facilities to pupils over the summer months in a partnership with local sports clubs and community groups, uh, hopefully to provide physical sporting opportunities and opportunities for social interaction. Now, I would include the STEM clubs uh, and opportunities to give young people the chance to explore other subjects like drama, art, music, etc., etc., for the less sporty and the less sporting-minded. How do you? How do the panel feel about properly funded? Outside school time activities being ex- uh, expanded uh, and also an expansion of organized summer activities as we try to have a normal life or as normal life as possible during this pandemic. We're open to Thanks. The Thanks for that, Morris. Morgan, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, the buildings should be used during the summer by community groups. There's no reason why they shouldn't. And I'd say that they probably should have been doing that before the pandemic, but especially this year. So people have, you know, time to catch up with their friends and time to enjoy the activities that they love. And I'd also say that, you know, even without the community groups, the school, the buildings should just be open, whether it's, you know, a sports hall, the library, music rooms, and they should do the school should just say to the students, these are here if you want to use them just whenever you like. These are the hours that they're open rather than, uh, you know, alongside the scheduled activities run by um, whatever groups there may be using the buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for that, Morgan. Anyone else want to come in? Do you have a, yeah, Cormac, and then you have another question, Mars, there. Yep. Cormac? Yeah. Cool. Yep. No, I, I just quickly wanted to add that um, when we launched our mental health report on Zoom, which I know some of the committee members were there for um, as uh, panellists in our Q&A session, Professor Siobhan O'Neill had presented a plan to a live event that was very similar to that. And I think that, that would be a really, really beneficial to children and young people to be able to have the sort of social interactions um, that they would that they have missed out on during the pandemic and to be able to get into school, an environment in the building that they're very, very familiar with and very comfortable in and have those kind of organized activities and you know everything from sport to drama to music to, um and i think that there should definitely be funding available and that should be prioritized and that's key in putting the well-being first and rec- and educational recovery and catch-up second thanks mars uh chair shared education was also uh, mentioned during the presentation uh, and i have a great belief in shared and integrated education and it gives the kids a chance to meet fellow students from, from different backgrounds, and partnerships and opportunities to engage in meaningful learning experiences. Uh, that's not the kind of the friendships that are forged and the barriers that are broken down. So I, I share that concept kind of enthusiastically. But the existence of a controlled, Catholic-maintained, Irish medium and integrated education systems, I feel are in some instances not good value for money. What are the thoughts of the young people on one education system covering all the aforementioned having a shared and integrated education as its ethos? Thanks for that, Morris. Uh, Sophia, bring you in on that one. Yeah, um, I think I speak from I've only ever known integrated education. I've only ever gone to integrated schools. Um, and as community relations officer with the SSU and I, um, I have met with what we're now going to meet on Friday, the last of the sectoral bodies. So talking to each of them, and we've been talking about their unique challenges, 
And I think having the different bodies, it's really important to keep cultural aspects of like like Sina G, that's um, Irish medium schools, having those aspects in the background, like they're really important. One body wouldn't necessarily maintain that to the degree that Sina G is now. But looking at it from a perspective of having a body that looks after all schools and make sure that funding goes out adequately, like talking to each of the sectoral bodies, funding seems to be a bit of an issue. Um, and it's one that's been brought up numerous times to us. Um, having one body that would look after all the funding would be incredible, but obviously that's not the case at the minute. Um, I think in regards to shared education, I'm obviously working on the working group. And I've said before, I'm quite critical of shared education sometimes, but I always look at it from the perspective that I've made so many amazing friendships through that. And the fact that I've missed that during this lockdown, like I was involved with EA for eight years with the TBOC programs and having missed that this opportunity this year and I'm probably going to I lost it last year and this year not having being able to maintain those friendships it's really affected me I'm quite much so an, an extrovert I'm not being able to maintain a community relationship like amongst the communities particularly on the peninsula here it's really affected me thanks that's Sophia anyone else want to come in on that okay Morris yeah, Chair, Chair, I'm pushed for time. I have a hospital appointment at one o'clock, but uh, just, just I'll say one thing on the issue of counselling and the feedback I get back from, from schools is that there is not enough counselling available. And I think that we as a committee, we've had extra money from the executive uh, to cope with the pandemic, to cope with COVID. But I, need, I think we need to have extra money from the executive to deal with post-COVID issues in education, in particular with an emphasis on providing the counselling phases of schools and a greater, greater avail availability to have counselling in a safe and confidential school setting. And with that, Chair, and apologies to the rest of the panel, I, I, I have to shoot. Thank you, Morris, and a good wishes for that appointment. Thank you, Morris. Thank you very much. Bye. All the best. All the best. Okay, members and um, young people, uh, brings us to an end of our session. Thank you so much um, for giving so much time today. Uh, for all the all the work that you're doing, for your advocacy on behalf of yourselves and your your friends and peers, uh, it it is inspirational. Um, it is challenging, and as as Justin said, we will do our best to step up to the mark uh, for you in relation to the issues that you've raised. We'll 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 review those now with the committee clerk, and we'll agree actions following from the evidence session today, but um, I think I speak on behalf of all the committee members that it's been a really uplifting session with you today. Um, and we'll do all we can to, to partner with you uh, going forward. Um, good wishes to you and everything that you're, you're doing at the moment in terms of your, your return to your, your routines and, and school and college as soon as possible. Um, I look forward to hearing what you all achieve in the future as well. There's a people going places here so thanks very much indeed uh, guys and i hope you you valued your engagement with us today as much as we valued um, our engagement with you thank you okay can i ask assembly broadcasting to remove all of the witnesses and add all members back into the spotlight and ask the clerk to summarise any actions or requests for additional information resulting from our briefing today. Okay, um, Chairperson, I think um, first up, um, the committee will want to just write to thank the witnesses um, for their evidence and their stamina today. Um, Hansard has been Agreed. covered. Yeah. <laughs> And covering the meeting, um, so the witnesses are on the record. Um, there's a uh, there be um, a full report of of the meeting, um, and we can let the witnesses know when that has been published. Um, and I think then um, the second action would be um, to send the complete Hansard to the department um, and to write about some of the you know highlight points in the meeting. Um, I think the committee would want to urge uh, the department to take on board the young people's perspectives on restart and um, their anxieties about safety, um, the dismay at the exams plans um, 
and ask for an urgent response on this idea that there's going to be an assessment blitz, um, you know, the minute that they return, and um, make an urgent case for much more comprehensive access to counselling services in school, like on a daily basis, and that's now and post-COVID, um, <coughs> and ask for clarity on the investment um, and strategy behind uh, implementing the mental health and wellbeing framework. Um, just to summarise slightly then, um, other points that were raised, young people and their groups are addressing physical and mental health and self-care challenges, creating groups and networks and sanctuaries via ambassadors in schools. Um, they argue for the right to disconnect, um, to try to find a balance between, between screen time and um, physical and preferably outdoor activity not necessarily in traditional sports clubs, but also drama, walking services, mindfulness clubs, support animal clubs. Um, and they felt that online classes, this remote learning has felt very like lectures. Um, so there's a lack of interaction and then there's fewer opportunities for pastoral care um, by teachers. And the argument was made that extracurricular activities and venues should still be available to young people uh, during periods of lockdown. Um, to compensate um, for some of that social isolation. Um, on International Women's Day then, um, there were perspectives from the young women on the panel um, promoting widespread provision and availability of period products so that it's not an impediment to participation in education and other activities that are developmental. Um, and also endorsing the option to wear trousers um, for all pupils at school um, and that because that would give um, young women equal comfort and decorum um, particularly um, during their period um, so I think we also want to ask how uh, the department and the executive more broadly um, intend to improve communications um, and involvement of children and young people in decisions um, with the suggestion of regular youth press conferences um, and the committee might also wish to invite CCA CCEA to brief um, on exams. Um, we've already been reaching out to them just to see whether they might be available to come on the meeting um, of the 24th. Uh, so if members have any other actions, um, please let me know. A very comprehensive summary, <laughs> Clark, thank you. Yeah, I'll bring Robin in. Yep. Robin? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Yes, I agree. The, it is a comprehensive survey, sur summary of what was a very long uh, meeting and uh, really, I have to say, really enjoyed hearing the views uh, and, and seeing the talent that, that is on uh, display there. But can I, in terms of the uh, the overall uh, response, I think, yes, obviously the Minister does need to see it. But I think also uh, the Executive Office needs to see a copy of it as well, the Chair. Because if, if we are to uh, really address some of these issues, which have been coming up for a number of months now, um, in fact, maybe longer than a number of months, um, the need for a joined up action as we move out of the pandemic. And it would, I think, be useful for the executive to have a copy of, of the uh, report as well. I think, I think that's a fair point, Robin. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the evidence given was, was so rich. As you say, um, it's a it's a valuable record of of contributions that the education minister can take a lead on, but that other departments can draw from as well. Uh, I think that's a fair point, Robin. Chair, um, yeah. point. is that um, Robin? Yes, please, Chair. I've just I've I, I know I can't see your beautiful face. Sorry, go ahead there, Robin. Okay. Um, no, it's, it's just when, uh, picking up on the point um, that I made with the guys that they're. Um, today, we're not speaking at them, we're speaking to them today, and I just wonder, have the department or CCA actually interacted with any of the groups? Uh, and if not, can we encourage them to do so? Um, because really, you know, this is a, a unique and bespoke uh, arrangement that needs to be created for these young people, and really their voice should be heard. So we have heard them, so I would encourage CCA and, and the department to also engage. Yep, I, th I think that's a that's a fair uh, addition, Robbie. I I'll be honest; I always find it quite strange when it seems like a, a committee with the modest resources we have compared to a department or uh, an NDPB seem to engage more substantively with some of the 
key stakeholder groups than, than they do. But so, yes, I think that's a constructive suggestion. Obviously, they'll get the record, but um, no, uh, no reason for them not to build on the engagement that we've initiated today themselves. Okay, anyone else want to come in there? Or content to agree all those actions? Great. Agreed. Really? Oh, just time has gone on. Members, thank you for thank you for uh, remaining with us. We've just got uh, agenda item six correspondence to make our way through here um, while we're still here. But th thank you for um, the engagement that um, you've been involved in with today. Clark, do you want to speak to correspondence at agenda item six? You're on, you're on, you're on mute, Avi. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me just uh, get that page up. So I can refer members to page 34, where we have 24 items of correspondence and a summary note included at page 36. Okay, so um, there's, there are tabled items as well, and I'll deal with the ones in the main pack first of all. Um, item 6.2 on page 39 is a response from the Minister of Education on vaccination of special school staff. Um, the response doesn't provide a timeline um, as requested by the committee. Um, the committee wrote about this again last week and actually during this meeting has received a response again without a timeline. So obviously that's not entirely pinned down due to the different stakeholders who are um, rolling it out. So members, I don't know what your response might be on that. Is it something to speak to the minister about next week? Yeah, can I, I speak to that briefly, Clark? Um, it, and this has been um, uh, highlighted in the media today as well, but I think this is actually, I think the, the headline has actually missed the, the full extent of the problem here. Um, yes, the delay has been unacceptable, but if I refer members to 62 which is the correspondence from the Minister of Education. And then 6.4, sorry to jump ahead, is the response from the Minister of Health. The, the language being used by the Minister of Education and the Minister of Health are actually different. That's a factual observation. Um, the, the, the Minister of Education um, talks about um, the delivery of vaccination to special school staff who are supporting children and young people with the most complex healthcare needs. They're also clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, doesn't say much more than that. However, the Minister for Health uses uh, language like um, plans are being finalised to vaccinate a limited number of staff in special schools who provide close personal care to a small number of clinically vulnerable children. And I have to say the feedback that I am getting from special school staff is one of, of, one of um, disappointment and, and also um, giving up. I, I think special school staff thought that there was going to be at least a reasonable number of special school staff receiving vaccination. And I, I think I'm not, I'm not aware of a special school staff member that has been, has been vaccinated to date or, or how many actually will be vaccinated going on, on that language. Um, I think that they're probably the specific follow-up questions that we need to ask, which are when and how many special school staff are actually going to be vaccinated. And given the commitments that were made, we can respond in writing to the Minister of Education and the Minister of Health about that. And as the says, the Minister of Education will be with us next week. Did members want to comment on this? Joe, could I come on that, please? Yeah, I agree. I agree with everything. <clears throat> Sorry, everything you said there. Um, it's, it's, it's not just the issue of vaccination for teachers. The special schools testing program for COVID was supposed to be rolled out, but now we're, we're being told it's not going to be offered within the time frame that was communicated to staff and uh, stakeholders. So that's going to have another impact on, on the special schools as well. And I think we should incorporate that in any communication we're going to have with both, uh, both ministers that refer to education and health. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Pat. So if we, if we respond, we can bring in a second, but just a, just a, develop, a, a, you know, a, a developing 
Um, action there seems to be that we do respond to the Minister of Education and the Minister of Health to seek an urgent update on the timeline for special school testing and indeed school testing um, and detail on how many and when special school staff will be vaccinated. Right, Robin, sorry, bring you in there. Yes, Chair, I mean, I think I, I've argued both in the committee and in the, uh, in the chamber what I believe uh, was the need for um, special education needs uh, teachers and staff to, to, to receive the, the vac vaccination. But in the letter you referred to, Chair, dated the 3rd of March, March. Yeah. Um, the 1, 2, 3, one, two, three four, the 5th and 6th uh, paragraph of that letter indicate that the Minister of Health is very much being led uh, by the recommendations and advice of the Independent Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. Uh, and he has said in the sixth paragraph, JCVI has not recommended prioritisation by occupation. Therefore, there are no plans at present to vaccinate staff in mainstream schools at District Cooper. Um, However, plans are being finalised finalised to vaccinate a limited number of staff in special schools to provide close personal care to a small number of clinically vulnerable staff. Now, those words would give me cause for concern in terms of what I think we had so at least some indications that a vaccination programme in a uh, special needs school was uh, nearly, if it wasn't that, the, the, the doorstep of the school was nearly there. Yeah, I, I agree, Robin. Um, the, the policy was announced on the 1st of February. It's now the 10th of March, and special schools have obviously been open since January. Um, yeah. You know, I... I like I said, the the, the, feed, the kind of the correspondence I'm receiving from special schools is that they've 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 actually just given up hope of of this of of this reaching them, um, which is is a really bad state of affairs. Um, well, I agree, Chair. But could could we, in our correspondence with the Minister for Health, seek clarification as to whether or not he is not willing to step outside the recommendations? of JCVI, because if he isn't, then vaccination of schools is not going to happen. Yeah, I, I, would, ask, I, would, I would respond to that, I suppose, Robin, as well, though, and, and I realize we're, we're pushed for time here. However, my, my under, I, I, I appreciate um, the need to uh, respect the, the JCVI approach, and I, I think that's been an, a, an executive approach to a certain extent. However, my understanding was that the key principles um, of the JCVI approach were um, to limit mortality and to maintain the health service. Now, there are health service functions delivered via our special schools, you know, multiple therapies, etc. So yeah. my understanding was that this wasn't, a, that this isn't a, a step outside JCVI necessarily, and and it's it, you know that that was why it was it was possible to proceed on the first of February with this because it, it was in line with the, the the JCVI principles of of maintenance of of health service, but the extent to which that has been narrowed to a limited number of of staff in special schools who provide close personal care to a small number. Of clinically yeah. vulnerable children, I, I I think that is more narrow than yeah. most of us thought yes. it was going to be, even under those JCVI principles. Um, and I think we do need clarification around um, wh why that has been interpreted so narrowly, and, and and how many special school staff that would actually, you know, uh, uh, include, and and can it not be a more broader a more broader category of staff, given the health service um, that is provided in, in that context. That, that, that was my understanding. 
Uh, I don't disagree with anything you've said there, Chair. I think that was a general understanding. Mm. Uh, and I think what has been specifically said in paragraph five and six of that letter does need clarification. Okay. Clark, do you have enough to go on there in terms of what the correspondence will look like? Yeah? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any other members want to come in on that? I read, that's kind of 6.2 and 6.4 covered there, Clark, I think. Yeah, that's okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Um, um, okay, so item 6.5 then on page 50 is a response from the department outlining the qualifications um, that are available, um, which are equivalent to those offered by the WJAC. Um, so members uh, may have some views on, on this response. Yeah, my, sorry, my, my view is that we, we know there are um, other uh, providers that offered courses that were offered by WJC, but I, I don't think their content is necessarily the same as WJEC. I think that's part of the problem. Um, I think that's maybe one in the interest of time that we might need to give some thought to and, and, and raise with the minister or, or, or return back to. Members content with that or any, any specific comments on that today? Yes, Chair. Um, uh, yep. Let me come on in. Yeah, I yep. mean, we have been approached by quite a number of teachers uh, around this issue. And I mean, the view is is that there are some courses in the in the WJEC board that don't have the equivalent here. Uh, so, I mean, we need we need some clarification around that, first of all, but I agree with the point you made about the different content and the focus as well. So, uh, it's something we should follow up on. Thanks. If, okay. Well, well, if members are content to respond in, in, in that nature, uh, Clark, to say that we're, we're aware that there are al alternative qualifications, but the concern is that the, it was the, the specific content of the WJEC um, for, uh, subjects that um, that schools were so concerned about not having access to. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, then the uh, item six seven on page sixty three is a response from the education authority regarding conversion therapy. Uh, the education authority chairperson has not commented on the social media post by a member of the board. Um, which this committee referred over via a letter from the health committee. Um, but the chairperson has stated the EA's commitment to equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, so members, just taking your views on that response. Yeah, Clark, so I, I mean, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a welcome, it's a welcome commitment, a welcome reassurance from the Education Authority, but perhaps in our response, thanking them for their letter, we could seek further assurance um, that there hasn't been any any uh, breaches of codes of conduct or anything like that um, in relation to the matter. Would, would members be content with that? Chair, sure, that's, uh, that, that's one angle we could go at, but I mean, it's, it's okay for the Education Authority to say what they have said. Uh, but it's not uh, it's not proper that they should ignore that a member of their organisation made the comments that they did make, uh, and instead of skirting around the issue, they should be with it head on. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Pat, yeah, I think that's why it's meritorious for us to return to seek assurances that the the the, the post. Um, did not, you know, did not breach any any codes of conduct because, as you say, it, it, it's a it's a welcome iteration of the EA's commitment to its statutory duties. It, it doesn't respond directly to the, the the concerns that were raised. Is that is that fair enough? So just to recap, um, are members content to forward the response to the health committee and reply to the EA asking? Whether there's been a breach of code of conduct? Seek, yeah, just seeking assurances. I would say, Clark, that that there has not been because it, I don't think that that's been addressed in the response that we've received there. Um. Okay, on the issue about social media posts by board member. Okay. 
Yeah. Is that members content? Agreed. So, yeah. Okay. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Um, then um, item 68 on page 67 is a response from CCEA to the committee's follow-up letter um, to the evidence session with CCEA on the Deloitte report. Um, so are members content to schedule an informal meeting um, with CCEA on their five-step plan, which they've now finalised? Agreed. 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 Thanks. Um, um, item 69 on page 70 is correspondence from CCA again providing notification of new exam arrangements which have come up earlier in the meeting. Um, the GCSE, AS and A level grades will be arrived at using teacher professional assessment known as centre determined grades. Um, so uh, members there's an informal meeting with a view to, to uh, uh, there's an informal meeting agreed at the top of the meeting. Um, with the unions um, on CCEA's plans. Um, mm -hmm. Are you content to that that should be your action just now with a view to a formal briefing then from CCEA uh, as soon as yep. possible? Agreed. Agreed. Agreed, thanks. Uh, thank you. Then um, item 613 on page 97 is correspondence from the Public Accounts Committee about issues regarding the Board of Governors approvals at a school. Um, are you content to write to the Education Authority seeking an update on the matters raised in that correspondence? Agreed. Agreed. Agreed, thank you. Um, item 615 on page 165 is correspondence from the British Heart Foundation um, seeking a, mem a meeting with the committee chairperson and deputy regarding an upcoming private members bill on mandatory CPR training in post-primary schools. Um, I would suggest that perhaps an informal meeting with the Heart Foundation and the member in charge, um, who's Colin McGrath, would give members a sense of what the PMB proposes. Yeah, content with that, agreed. Yep, yeah. agreed okay. members. Yeah, agreed. thanks. Um, item 619 on page 307 is correspondence from OMA Learning Community seeking reassurance and early confirmation of funding for the Engage programme for the rest of the academic year, for the academic year 21-22 um, and for clarity that it can be, that this money can be used to employ staff who are not teachers but who are nevertheless capable of delivering the support required. Um, so members, are you content to write to the department um, for its response to that list of matters? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Um, item 620 on page 308 is correspondence from the RSPB providing a copy of a letter to the Finance Minister regarding the establishment of a Green Recovery Fund. Members, are you content to write to the department for information on what actions um, it would include for schools under such a fund? Agreed. Great. Great. Thank you. Item 624 on page 348 is correspondence from an individual regarding concerns on how a return to school will affect clinically extremely vulnerable um, CEV individuals and their families. Um, and I think members you will have received uh, under individual cover um, a list of campaign asks um, um, from, from this group. So perhaps um, the committee could write to the department asking what measures are in place to support uh, CEV individuals and their families and what their response is to campaign asks. Does that sound reasonable? Agreed. Agreed. Can, can I just say, Chair, that, that, that is not out of line with the um, our thinking, the committee's thinking, if I'm right in this, in terms of the approach to uh, special education and needs pupils uh, as well. There is a, a group here that, that are an active, I believe, are falling uh, through the cracks uh, in, in getting their necessary uh, treatment. So I'd be quite enthusiastic about getting that letter off chair. Okay, yeah, members agreed. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so then, um, tables today are letters from individuals um, on a range of issues. Um, so first issue is problems uh, with C2K and related digital learning platforms. Um, 
the proposal that there should be strategic public messaging to reassure children about coming back to face-to-face -face learning, um, asking about provision of Irish um, via uh, the WJEC, um, con conveying concerns about public health and school restart, um, rural needs concerns about the closure of Brawla School, and again, questions about the CCEA announcement of centre-determined assessments. Um, so do members agree to seek replies from the department with these correspondence? Seems reasonable, yeah, agreed. Thank you. Um, table today is a letter from the department highlighting new funding for the educational elements of phase two of the DOJ tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime programme. Table today are also responses um, from the department to the committee's questions on a new child care sustainability fund. Um, do members agree to request an in-year budget briefing um, from the department to address plans for um, funding other funding priorities and a comprehensive child care strategy? Sounds reasonable, yeah, agreed. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Table today is an emotional health and wellbeing um, follow up response to the committee's evidence session on the Blues programme. Are members content to forward that to the Blues programme um, to Action for, Action for Children? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, thank you. Um, table today is also um, a DE response to the committee's question about children looked after and a notification that the department is pausing the review of home to school transport pending the review of education. Are members content to note these for reference and discuss them with the minister next week? Fair enough, yep, yeah, agreed. Okay, um, members, that being the case, um, are you content to dispose of the other correspondence as per the summary note at page 36? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Clark. Then agenda item set. Yes, sorry. Pat, yeah. In terms of the correspondence, I know there was correspondence from St Mary's High School in Brolla, Vermont. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I know the minister has approved a decision to close that particular school, and I, I have been expecting that there will be correspondence this week around that particular issue. Uh, I'm wondering if the clerk has any information around that. Um, I, I simply have the information that was in the letter, which described, you know, a lot of kind of rural proofing and rural needs concerns about the closure of the school. It's, yeah. a, it's a small, it's a small school. It's a, a successful school, um, but it's obviously, you know, um, this decision has been made. Uh, so it was among that group of letters that um, the committee agreed just now to seek replies from the department about Pat. Yeah, is there additional that you would like. I, I suppose I just wanted to flag up the issue, you know, and I suppose most of us are in agreement that schools need to be sustainable, but it's also the case that one size doesn't fit all, and in this particular instance, this is a very a school in a very remote area. If if it closes, children are going to have to travel over twenty five miles to Anniskillen probably to get to school. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's some way we can raise this issue with the minister uh, in, in regard to his decision. Yes, that, that, that's the agreed action, Pat, is to, is to send that correspondence to, to receive the minister's response in the first instance and then take it from there. Obviously, if we we'll have enough time, you, it can be raised with him next week as well then. Okay. That's seemed reasonable, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Okay, then, members, so forward work programme, agenda item seven. The forward work programme is at page 365, and the committee agreed at its 17th of February meeting to invite the commissioner to present the still waiting report update, a uh, response to the department's draft send regulations and code of practice. And we will hear from the department on the 21st of April. Our, our members consent to schedule a session with the children's commissioner before the department, alongside Autism NI on the 14th of April, and uh, to then schedule our session with Professor Lundy to the 20th of April. Members content? Agreed. 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 Thanks. Okay, then, uh, members content to endorse the forward work program as amended? Agreed. 
Great. Great. Thank you. Okay, members, agenda item eight is any other business? Any members have any other business? No. Um, Chair, there's just the fact that the uh, ministers and um, people have come through during the meeting to say that they could, um, that the minister could attend at 3.30 on Tuesday, the 23rd, if that were preferable. Okay. Um, do are members content just to go into a, a sh very short closed session just to tidy up that housekeeping before we finish? Yeah. Content. Yeah. Okay. Um, if assembly broadcasting can move us into closed session, then thank you.